Good, Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our regular scheduled November City Council meeting. If you could all rise and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. You all be seated. Madam Clerk, you call the roll, please. Councilor Bouchard. Here. Mayor Boulay. Here. Councilor Brown. Here. Councilor Champlin. Present. Councilor Fennessy. Here. Councilor Grady Sexton. Here. Councilor Keach. Here. Councilor Kredovic. Here. Councilor Matson. Here. Councilor McLaughlin. Uh, excuse me. Councilor McNamara. Here. Councilor Nyan. Present. Councilor Pierce. Here. Councilor Rice Hawkins. Here. And Councilor Todd. Here. Thank you. Good to see everyone. Uh, we have uh, the minutes before the October 11, 2022 City Council meeting. Is there a motion? Move approval. approval. Second. Actually made second to approve the minutes. Is there any changes, concerns, thoughts? Abstain. Councilor Rice Hawkins? Just abstain for me. Should be standing. Okay. Sorry. Didn't hear you. Uh, anyone else? Seeing none. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? The ayes have it. Motion is adopted. Um, can I get a motion on the consent agenda, please? So Move approval. approval. Motion made by everyone and seconded by everyone <laughs> to approve the consent agenda. Um, not, I have nothing being removed. Is that correct? Okay. With that, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Aye. Yes, have it. The consent agenda is adopted. Takes us to item 20A, which is the public hearings. Um, Madam Clerk. First item is an ordinance amending the Code of Ordinances, Title II Traffic Code, Chapter 18 Parking, Article 18-1, Stopping, Standing, and Parking, Section 18-1-6, Parking Prohibited at All Times in Designated Areas. Thank you very much, Mr. Manager. Got members of the Council, on September 26, the Parking Committee held a neighborhood meeting to discuss residents' concerns regarding parking on the street. Seven residents testified about parking changes. Upon review, the Parking Committee voted unanimously to recommend repeal of parking regulations enacted by Ordinance 3109 on Spruce Street between Allison and West Streets. Should the City Council approve the attached ordinance, the parking uh, shall be permitted on both sides of the road. Glad to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Any questions of the manager? Seeing none, we'll open the public hearing. Any wishing to speak on parking on Spruce? Seeing none, close the public hearing. Madam Clerk, item 21B, please. It's an ordinance amending the Code of Ordinances, Title I, General Code, Chapter One, Government Organization, Article 1-5, Fees, Fines, and Penalties. Mr. Manager. Got a member of the Council. Most of the department fee increases uh, have previously been presented to City Council as the uh, Council's ad hoc committee to review fee schedules completed various stages of, uh, during the review process. During their meeting held on September 6, the ad hoc committee reviewed the remaining fees. Engineering division fees were revised earlier this year along with changes uh, to the inspection fund. Be glad to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Any questions of the manager? Seeing none, open the public hearing on this item. Anybody wish to testify? Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing. Madam Clerk, item 20C, please. It's an ordinance amending the Code of Ordinances, Title I, General Code, Chapter 1, Government Organization, Article 1-5, Fees, Fines, and Penalties, including Schedule 2. Mr. Manager. And members of the Council, the uh, comparative analysis was undertaking, undertaken, and as part of the annual work plan, the Parking Committee initiated a review of the City's current parking ban citations, as well as associated notification process and tow policies. The Committee's recommendation are as follows. Based upon its review, the Parking Committee voted unanimously to recommend the following changes to the parking ban citation. A, reduce the citation from $100 to $50. No escalations shall occur after 10 and 20 business days, respectively. Rather, the ticket will remain at $50 value in perpetuity. Uh, item B, uh, vehicles that are impounded during the parking ban shall continue to pay the $185 tow fee. However, recognizing this cost is a significant deterrent, the $50 citation fine will be waived. If these modifications had been in place in the fiscal year 22 budget, Winter parking ban revenues would have decreased from $29,960 to $3,500, an 88% reduction. Uh, details in the table um, are provided in the report. Glad to answer any question. Any question of the manager? Seeing none, open the public hearing. Anyone wish to testify on this item? Mr. Schweiker. <coughs> Good evening and welcome. Glad to see you got your leaves picked up this year. Most of them. 
Good evening, mayors, members of the city council, city manager, and city clerk. I'm Roy Schweiker, and I oppose this. I mean, I think that the fee is very excessive or very large for having your vehicle impounded and towed during a snowstorm. But I think it's your own fault. I mean, don't you know it's snowing? Don't you know the city has a towing ordinance? And so what I would like to see is the, this, we've re referred to the parking committee to figure what is the cost of issuing a citation in terms of presumably the people out during the snowstorm issuing the citations are all getting paid overtime. This is one of the more expensive, you know, tickets to issue. So I would like to see the price of this ticket to the city based on the cost to the city of issuing it rather than simply saying, well, these guys are, you know, uh, paying a big tow fee already, so we'll give them a break. If they want a break, don't park on the street during a snowstorm. This is one of the, you know, most obvious regulations. I mean, you drive around New Hampshire and Vermont, you'll see signs everywhere, you know, no, no parking on city streets during the winter period. So if someone is stupid enough to park on the street during a snowstorm, let them pay the cost of issuing them the ticket instead of making the general taxpayers pay it through our property taxes. And as far as not escalating it, once again, my mother was in a situation where she got an escalated parking ticket. Apparently, the ticket that they put on her windshield blew away, so she never saw it. But she had to pay the escalated ticket because she hadn't paid it in time. Whereas if your vehicle is towed, you blame well know it's been towed. You know you've got this citation. It's not like you know, you're getting hit with an escalated fee because you didn't know that this had happened to you. So I think that to the extent that other tickets pay escalated fees, this one should also pay an escalated fee. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? So you don't think the $185 tow charge, having to find time of the day to go find your car, come to the police station, and then go out to the parking lot to get your car from towed, pay the 185 in cash or however, and be on your way? You don't think that's punishment enough for making a mistake that you parked overnight? Okay, no I don't think you should punish the property taxpayers because some other idiot parked his vehicle on the street and it's the rest of us who are paying for this parking enforcement officer overtime to go out and issue the citation. So did you it, hear did you hear how much money heard, we were talking about from last year? Twenty nine thousand dollars. Okay. And I don't know what it costs for overtime for parking enforcement officers to go out during snowstorm and issue tickets but I will bet that it's probably close to that, and I don't see why property taxpayers should be paying for people who are making what should be an obvious bad move. I understand that uh, you know people who've gotten hit by this fee are very unhappy about it, and I, if I got hit by that fee, I'd be unhappy about it too, but I feel it was my own stupid fault because, I mean, didn't I see it was snowing? Didn't I know there was a rule? No, thank you very much, appreciate it. Good to see you as always. Anyone else wish to testify on this item? Seeing that, we'll close the public hearing. Madam Clerk, item 20D, please. It's a resolution appropriating the sum of $166,000 for the Hall Street Wastewater Treatment Plant renovations and to apply for and accept the sum of $166,000 from the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services American Rescue Plan Act program for this purpose. Mr. Manager. And members of the council, the department was notified that New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services has reserved 166,000 in grant funding for the replacement of a sludge holding tank missing system at the Hall Street Wastewater Treatment Plant. The existing sludge holding tank system was installed by city staff in the mid 1990s and has been a continuous operation for nearly 30 years and has come to an end of its useful life. At present, the wastewater treatment plant staff is completing the installation of identical new mixing system in a second storage tank at the plant. The unplanned emergency installation is required due to a catastrophic failure of the existing mixing system, internal piping, and air diffusing system this past spring. It's just anticipated the city staff will complete the installation activities on the second tank, which is being covered in full by the proposed ARPA grant funding. I'd be glad to answer any questions. Any questions? See none, we'll open the public hearing. Anyone wish to testify on this item? See none, we'll close the public hearing and we'll simply say, uh, Council Warmington, thank you for our, our wastewater treatment plants. Happier for the dollars you brought home. There you go. <laughs> Never thought you'd hear that tonight, did you? <laughs> <laughs> um, Madam Clerk, item 20E, please. 
It's a resolution appropriating the sum of $80,217 for the purchase of two all-terrain vehicles and related transport equipment and accepting the sum of $80,217 in America Rescue Plan Act funding through the New Hampshire Department of Justice. Mr. Manager. And members of the council, with the increased use of trails, the city has experienced an uptick in violent criminal activity and other crimes on the trails and on the conservation areas uh, to include a double homicide. These areas are not easily accessible on foot or by bicycle when investigating or patrolling. With the use of two all-terrain vehicles, ATVs, the police department will be able to monitor the trail system and conservation areas more effectively and proactively. The New Hampshire Department of, Ju department of Justice will serve as the fiscal agent and primary administrator of the ARPA Act funds. Um, the Concord Police Department will utilize funding provided by this group to purchase two all-terrain vehicles, a trailer, and a pickup truck. It's recommended the City Council accept and appropriate this funding. Glad to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, Council Fennessy. <coughs> Thank you. Um, Mr. Manager, is there an expectation uh, if we approve this and we purchase these vehicles that there'll start being some regular patrolling done of the, uh, of the trails? The, 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 there is going to be uh, patrolling of the trails, but it, will, it won't be on a regular basis. This will be pr provided as, as uh, staffing's available and as incidents occur. So I could particularly see a lot more activity. And if there's, for example, use one example, homeless camps on public property, because that's also on the agenda, there'd be something to that extent. Uh, but you also will recall, we did this a uh, uh, short while ago with the fire department, being able to get access and provide emergency response services to people because there are so many people out on the trails now that actually we see this as a uh, being uh, not only re responsive but also being proactive by being out on the trails. But we, we also, working with the Conservation Commission, want to make sure the, these vehicles are not impacting in a negative way uh, the, the trails and the Conservation Commission is in support of this. I got two, two quick questions, if I may. Uh, number one, the what's the status of the city's uh, trail ranger? We have a part-time trail ranger. In we, place. Okay, the, the, we had yeah. one. We hired one. They quit. We ha we hired one. They ended up leaving because right. I, it, primarily, without getting too in deep deep yeah. into it, it had to do with uh, in, the enforcement of activities on the trail. And some people are just built for that, and some people aren't. Okay, uh, thank you. The second question is. Uh, does any of this money include training for the officers? Is this a side-by-side -side ATV and H uh, use? The, the police department actually has uh, used ATVs in the past okay. and um, actually has a, actually a good training program. <coughs> you, the chief want to come up or? Not necessary, is it? Not necessary. I think he wants to come up. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this is a lot of great work done by the police department, pre you know, previous to this, leading up to this. This isn't, didn't just come out of the blue, so to speak. Thank you. The, uh, the training involved um, is provided for free by the uh, New Hampshire Fish and Game Department. Um, so they would, um, they've trained some of our officers already, and any of the officers that will be riding these will be certified by them. Great. Thank you. Any questions, questions since we have the chief here? Thank you. Uh, th this question is actually for the manager or the chief. Um, so has the Conservation Commission weighed in on the use of the ATVs on the trails? Yes. This may follow. Uh, the second question is, um, will other departments be able to make use of the ATVs when they're not in use by the police department? They, they will be marked with police uh, identification, so we wouldn't want to have somebody that's not a police officer operating these vehicles. They've already told me I can't use it, <laughs> <laughs> even with a helmet. But Councilor Todd made a ward one. If you see him cruising around, <laughs> anything further? All set. Thanks, Chief. Thanks. Okay. Seeing no further questions, we'll open the public hearing on this item. Is anybody wishing to testify? Okay. Uh, Mr. Swiker. Well, again, uh, I, some of my questions have sort of been answered and sort of haven't been answered. Like as a, for instance, I wonder if our trail ranger would be allowed to utilize one of these, maybe 
one of them won't be marked as a police vehicle so the trail ranger can use it. I don't know if he can be appointed as a part-time officer so he can use it because it seems kind of strange that, you know, your staff member involved with the trails is not the one that's primarily using one of these. And the second thing has to do with, uh, you know, where and how they're used in terms of there are some trails that are well suited for ATV use, some that are not well suited for ATV use, some that are in between, and I'm particularly perturbed by a statement that the manager made in the proposal that they're used where bicycles aren't accessible, and my impression is if you know some mountain bikers, they can go a blame lot of places on a mountain bike. You cannot go on an ATV. Simply the bridges are too narrow or the you know, slope is too twisty or whatever. So I'm thinking that uh, if we really want some of these trails <coughs> patrolled, maybe let our bike patrol officers you know, do it sometimes on things that can't be done with the ATVs. And in particular, I'm going to suggest, and I don't know whether the Conservation Commission has figured this out yet, you know, give the police department a list of trails. You know, these trails are suitable for patrol regularly with uh, ATVs. These only if, uh, you know, there's not muddy. These only up to point X where the bridge is too narrow and people will get mad if you start driving across the brook. These not at all. Just to make it, you know, give them an idea of this from someone that's more familiar with the trails instead of the police department having to figure it out for themselves. And lastly, I see an issue that if people are regularly riding ATVs on the trails, even if they're police officers, the public's going to say, why aren't we riding ATVs on these trails if the police can cruise up and down all the time? You know, we should do it. They'll see the ATV track. They'll say, obviously, it's not a problem. We want to use ATVs. So I think there's going to be a big impetus if the police get out there very often that other people are going to want to ride ATVs on those trails. So I think that, you know, once again, the city needs to be proactive. The Conservation Commission needs to think about are the trails that the city should provide ATV trails. And, you know, once again, I'm not going to say which trails should or shouldn't. That's for the Conservation Commission. But I think you need to expect this is going to start happening, that the police are regularly riding ATVs on trails. The public is going to want to also. And in conjunction with that, in the Catskills, I know, they did that. They said, okay, you can ride an ATV on every trail that's suitable for it. And this turned out to be a very bad idea because trails that are suitable for ATVs are also suitable for elderly folks that walk with a cane, small children, and they didn't really want to be out on these trails when the ATVs were zooming, ATVs were zooming around. So just because a trail can be used safely by an ATV doesn't necessarily mean that you want it to be used by ATVs, in which case maybe the police you know, shouldn't be thinking about riding an ATV on it. They get more, you know, they can do a response if they get a call out there, but regular patrols, I think, are a bad idea. They're only going to convince the public we should be doing this too. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any more questions, Mr. Swigger? Seeing none, thank you very much. Hey there. Good evening. Welcome. Thanks. Uh, Boyd Smith Concord. And I didn't expect uh, to, to speak on this, but I enjoy the trails quite a bit. I hike all over Concord, and I think the uh, trails that we've got in town are remarkable. Um, so I'm not really clear on the purpose of uh, setting up, you know, the, the, the machines for the police as far as regular patrolling. Um, I don't think that's practical. Uh, it certainly would detract from my experience uh, as a you know, pedestrian on the trails. And I think Mr. Schweiker's point that some of those places you can't get with an ATV uh, is, is a good one. Um, I do recall the fire department uh, using ATVs, trying to get back out by the, uh, that little pond up above the, uh, the main reservoir that got set on fire a couple of times. I get that. You know, getting out there for emergency response, you take whatever you have and get there. But as far as regular patrolling with machines on our pedestrian network in this, this city, I'd just be against it. So That, that, that was a misleading statement. On, on my part? No. What did I miss? By the, by, the pre, by the previous presenter. It was specifically said there'll be no regular patrolling on trails. I'm I made, sorry. I made that, that presentation. That's the proposal? Uh, no regular patrolling? That's correct. Okay. So these I are said more. That, I said that right at the beginning. Sorry, my, my apologies. Right. Um, more of a. Uh, response. An emergency response, that's basically correct. to get in the woods when you get the call? That, that's correct. <coughs> okay. My apologies. That makes more sense to me. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, seeing that, we'll close public hearing. Madam Clerk, item 
Antonia, please. It's a resolution appropriating the sum of $45,000 for the purchase of used gas-powered golf carts to supplement the electric golf cart fleet for golf outings and authorizing the use of $45,000 from golf fund balance for this purpose. Mr. Manager. Members of the Council, the Beaver Meadow Golf Course has experienced incredible success with its golf outings over the past several years. The outing provided an opportunity for many nonprofit groups in the greater Concord area to raise funds for the organization and good work, including, and I'll list them out, the Boys and Girls Club, Junior Service League, the Hanneker Food Pantry, NHTI, Concord High School Hockey, the Bow Booster Club, Hopkinton Rotary, New Hampshire Football, Concord High School Baseball, New Hampshire Good Roads, Chamber of Commerce, NHWP, um, water, water folks, the um, Concord High School Football, Black Ice, um, the, the Association of um, uh, Engineers, uh, uh, the Connolly Legacy, the Concord Rotary, the Friends of 4-H, Bishop Brady, uh, Patrice Haggerty, White Birch, the Crime Line, and Play New Hampshire. Of the outings, 20 of, or more have had 110 players each of the past three years. When the city <coughs> moved to its current electric golf cart vendor program in 2021, the number of on-site cart rentals increased from 50 to 60. Since this renewal, the city has not been able to secure additional carts for outings and has scrambled between vendors of, of other golf uh, courses to support the additional 10 to 14 golf carts needed for um, applicable outings. The current golf uh, cart lease expires in November 2025. Purchasing an additional 10 to 14 carts to supplement outing needs will provide for a payback period of approximately three years and will allow the city to meet the needs of the outing with the highest level of customer service that they've grown to be expected at the golf course. The golf fund is more than sufficient to support this purchase. Glad to answer any questions. Those questions from the manager. Uh, Council Brown and Council Fennessey. Sure. I just have a few short ones. Uh, first of all, is there a nonprofit rate for these tournaments? Welcome, gentlemen. Did you hear the question? We did. Is there a nonprofit rate for the for the outings, Mr. Davis? Uh, no, no. Uh, everybody has the same rate. The same rate. Uh, follow up. Um, is that this is a forty-five thousand uh, dollar price tag? Is this is in the CIP in the budget? It's not currently in the CIP. That's why we're bringing it to the council as a supplemental appropriation during the course of the fiscal year. Thank you. I just have two more. Uh, is there any fundraising done by Beaver Meadow Golf Course? I know these are tournaments to fundraise. Is there any fundraising by the golf course for the golf course? Not, not specific fundraising outside of um, the fees associated with playing golf, outings, things like that. Just last one. In the last five years, um, has the golf course paid for itself? Has it covered its overhead fees? Uh, there have been a couple of years over the last five years where the general fund has supported the golf course um, for uh, to a certain extent. Uh, the past three years, the golf course has either broken even or made a fair profit. Mm -hmm. so. I, I thought I had seen in, in the budget that it, that wasn't the case for 2021. For 2021, the golf course, I don't recall the exact number, but it was pretty close to breaking even. 2020 in 2021 the golf course did very well it made about 240,000 in 2022 the golf course um, makes about 311,000 in 2020 I think it was close to a break even and I think in 2019 there was some support from the general fund thank you, Thanks, thank you. Um, I'll ask you gentlemen while you're up here so in my experience usually when you have uh, an outing that exceeds your cart capability you'd go and get rental carts has there been issues with uh, trying to obtain those rental carts in the market yeah I'll let mr davis yeah that yeah question. that has uh, been a struggle um pretty much since the uh, covid um since we reopened since then um it's been a very very difficult process to secure them um they most of the most of the companies are the company that we have a contract with want them secured by april 1st 
Uh, most of our nonprofits don't have final numbers until, you know, two weeks before, so it becomes very difficult to um, accommodate them in short notice. Is there an expectation um, when you're running an outing that all of the participants are going to ride in a cart? <clears throat> yes. And do you recognize additional fees from people riding in carts versus walking? Yes. Uh, all of our outings, um, the pricing is carts are built in, so everybody's expected to ride. Thank you. Who else? Pierce. Um, <clears throat> I think this is a great idea, and I'm surprised it took this long. <laughs> so thank you. Would you believe? <laughs> Would you believe? Would you believe? Well, and, and I will say that, you know, the outing uh, numbers have increased, you know, over the past couple of years as well. I mean, with the, the way that golf has gone, people are much more interested in playing, so the numbers in the outings have increased substantially. That's a great idea. Thank you, Your Honor. Fair weather days and poor weather days, are we not also running into the same issue when we have rain, people purchase carts? And then when we have super hot weather that's over 90 degrees, people purchase carts. When humidity is high, people purchase carts. And it's beyond what's the impact in the outings is, which is significant and what's in your report. But there are other occasions we're running into this as well. Is that true? Yes. Uh, I believe that if, if we purchase these golf carts, we're also going to supplement our 240 golfers on a weekend, um, days when we don't have, when we have 80 golf, uh, 80, uh, 80 person outings. Um, much easier to transition into um, regular play at the same time. Um, it'll just make everything much, much smoother. And, and I will imagine that we will rent them often, Thank you. often outside of just golf outings. Anyone else? Seeing them. Thank you very much, John. Okay. With that, anyone wish to testify on this item? Good evening, uh, Roland Bruby from Spalding Street. Can you um, repeat, are these gas powered or electric? Gas. Yes. Yes. Where does that fit in with um, our plan to be carbon neutral? So Ele electric's not available. I asked, I asked the same yeah. question. So yeah. we'd, buy, we'd buy electric if we could buy electric, but we can't buy electric. So why can't we wait until electric are available so that we can meet our carbon neutral uh, deadline that we are that, that's that's a choice so either provide the cart so people can use them or don't provide the cart so people can use them. so what you're saying is there's no possible way to get electric golf carts that's and to meet our what commitment to be carbon neutral yes okay well that's that's what we've been told by we've been tried if we could buy electric we'd buy electric I've been told we can't buy electric then I would, pr I would suggest that we hold off on this purchase until we can get electric to meet our carbon neutral goals. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. You know what? I'm going to do it one time. Please don't clap. Please don't clap. You know what? We're going to treat everybody the same. We're going to appreciate everybody and everybody says. And if you want to come share your thoughts, you're more than welcome. We'll sit here as long as you wish. But just don't need to clap. Okay. Anybody else want to testify on this one? Uh, Jessica Wheeler Russell from Penacook. Um, and I guess I have one question is um, ha, um, how much was it again? It's going to be 45000 you said. How long would that take um, to cover the cost? How many rentals three years, would you have to do? Three years. Three years? Okay. So three years. Um, so then I guess the only other thing I'd like to say is um, I kind of also agree with the previous speaker in that we probably should hold off um, and wait until we can obtain electric carts in order to uh, uh, continue our commitment to being carbon neutral. Um, my own children attend Boys and Girls Club. They're back there hanging out, listening. And um, I think it would be beneficial to continue to honor that commitment. That's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Anybody else? OK. With that, we'll close the public hearing. And Madam Clerk, item 20G, please. It's a resolution appropriating the sum of $39,989 for police department roadway safety and outreach initiatives and accepting the sum of $39,989 in grant funds from the New Hampshire 
Highway Safety Agency for this purpose. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Members of the Council, the New Hampshire Highway Safety Agency has provided grant funding to the police <coughs> department for many years in order for the department to conduct varied enforcement activities designed to improve the safety of the city's roadways. This grant includes funding for the following initiatives, speed patrols, uh, Operation Safe Commute, join the New Hampshire Click, uh, distracted driving patrols, pedestrian bicycle safety patrols, DWI impaired driver patrols, and community outreach. The community outreach portion of the grant is designed to bring the highway safety message to traditionally underserved New Hampshire drivers and vulnerable road users with fostering, uh, while fostering positive law enforcement and public interactions with groups such as um, refugees, new Americans, uh, hearing impaired drivers, youth drivers, and limited English proficiency groups. The funding provided by the highway safety covers the overtime costs associated with conducting these patrols <coughs> and outreach initiatives. Highway safety also provides an in-kind match to, uh, be provide, requires that an in-kind match be provided by the city as part of this grant award. The total amount of city match is $9,997.25. This in-kind match simply puts a dollar amount to the resources the city will be providing towards these patrols throughout the grant period. The city will easily match the covered, uh, provide the covered match uh, through equipment and vehicle costs and administrative costs in managing the grant. It is our intention to continue this valuable re relationship with highway safety, which allows us to place additional officers and equipment in the field to assist our continuing efforts to address traffic concerns and make our roadway safer. I'd be glad to answer any questions. Any other questions? Manager. Seeing none, we'll open the public hearing. The item may be wishing to testify. See, don't close public hearing, Madam Clerk, item 20H, please. It's a resolution appropriating the sum of $24,436 for law enforcement related programs and accepting the sum of $24,436 in unmatched grant funds from the United States Department of Justice for this purpose. Mr. Manager. Members of the Council, the grant program will provide uh, dollars to make technological upgrades, purchase new equipment, provide training for department personnel. There is no match required for this grant. However, we will have to enter into a memorandum of understanding with the County of Merrimack on programming and al the allotment of the funds. Under this agreement, and we've done this every year, under this agreement, the police department will receive $13,936 for technological upgrades, equipment purchases, and training, while the County of Merrimack will receive $10,500. Glad to answer any questions. Any questions? Seeing none, we'll open the public hearing. Any wish to testify on this item? So now we'll close public hearing. Madam Clerk, item 20I, please. It's a resolution appropriating the sum of $21,630 to support projects that enhance the special character and vitality of Concord and accepting the sum of $21,630 from the New Hampshire Charitable Foundation for this purpose. Mr. Manager. Members of the Council, for fiscal year 23, this allocation will be used to enhance public areas as identified and directed by the City Manager. Can I answer any questions? Any questions? Council Brown. I, I see this seems to be an annual event. Can you just tell us what it has been spent on in the past? Sure. You've done, you've spent dollars on, for example, the um, granite blocks that are in uh, Bicentennial Square, tree plantings. Um, in the past, the several, uh, past several years, you, because you cut out dollars due to the recession for improvements of the landscaping around City Hall and the library areas and police department, you've um, asked that those dollars be set aside for the, that purpose so the public can actually appreciate and use it. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else? No. Okay, we'll have no public hearing. Anyone wish to testify? Seeing none, close the public hearing. Okay, here it goes. This is where the fun begins. Uh, Madam Clerk, item 20J, please. It's a uh, public hearing on New Hampshire Department of Transportation proposed changes to I-93 Bow Concord. <coughs> okay, Mr. Manager. Let's pass this around. So the, um, I had asked the Department of Transportation in anticipation of this meeting to provide a uh, preliminary design, of course this is what we're talking about tonight, uh, next steps. So I think that would give the City Council the ability to understand what, what the next steps for the processes are and actually we'll provide it for the City Council uh, and, and the community. So with that, you may have provided this to the City Council, which we received. I'd like to be able to read this into the record so that people, and I think it'd answer a lot of questions that uh, people in the community have asked me about this. 
This letter is from uh, Jason Ayotte. Uh, he's the project manager. He's sitting back there, the, the, the good looking, not Gene McCarthy, the good looking man in the place. <laughs> back to the wall. Um, so this is addressed to me, um, and it says, I would like to thank the mayor, the city council, as well as yourself and city staff in allowing us the opportunity to present our latest proposal for the uh, Bow Concord I-93-89 improvements to move, for, to move the project forward. We recognize the attention, time, and energy that the city is committed towards listening and vetting the alternatives. We believe the presentations, public comment opportunities, and deliberations are in the spirit and vision of the originally proposed stakeholder group proposed, the stakeholder group proposed in 2019. Over the past 10 months, the department has brainstormed and evaluated options to resolve the differences in the exit 14 area to complete the environmental assessment and to ensure public support of this selected alternative. The department's proposal consists of incorporating the old uh, Turnpike Road intersection, completing the Merrimack River Greenway Trail through the projected areas, adding the exit 17 northbound on-ramp, and relocating the State of New Hampshire Railroad within the store street extension limits uh, is, um, is not a, um, extension limits is not a completed design, but rather a conceptual plan to establish a path forward that the city can support and continue to work with the department to refine the selected alternative. In addition to these proposed modifications in Concord, the department addressed the town of Bowes' concerns by modifying the I-89 exit one area after the November 2018 public hearing and received written approval from the town of Bow on August 25, 2020. Proposed modifications in Concord impact new areas, and the exit one area revisions impact several historic property properties modifications, which will require reevaluation with our agency partners and a revision of the environmental assessment. To accomplish the successful review, the department will be required to revise, complete, or conduct the following. Traffic modeling and study. The traffic study and preliminary engineering were completed in 2018 and several adjustments will need to be included the revision to exit one old turnpike road the exit 14 northbound on ramp as well as review the pandemic effects to update the traffic study similarly in response to the city council and transportation policy advisory committee questions the department will evaluate suggestions and ideas to present in the environmental assessment in the upcoming public informational meetings preferred alternative revisions Design will need to revise the preferred alternative to incorporate the modifications proposed, assess the impact to resources, and revise construction cost estimates. In addition, the design team will evaluate the impacts and the constructability of the preferred options for the Merrimack River Greenway Trail express, expressed during the Transportation Policy Advisory Committee meetings. Uh, agency review. The modifications require impact assessments and reevaluation by our state and federal agency partners for all areas outside the original area of potential effect and any mod modifications that change previously reviewed impacts within the area of potential effect. The department will need to add new historic properties, delineate wetlands, and present to natural and cultural resource agencies for input and concurrence and document the discussions and evaluations of the environmental assessment. The department will need to revise and update section 4F and the section 106 documents and will also need Federal Highway Administration approval. Public informational meetings. The department will present revised preliminary engineering, natural and cultural resource impact assessments, agency review, and hearing layout revisions to the town of Bow and the city of Concord prior to a public hearing. Our goal is to host the public informational meetings in spring 2023. Public hearing. The public hearing was held November 14, 2018. However, modifications require a second public hearing do the proposed right-of-way changes. The public hearing is a formal process overseen by a special committee appointed by the governor and council <coughs> to establish the limited access right-of-way and require time to establish and conduct a meeting. A public hearing by 2024 is preferred to begin final design and the necessary safety and red-listed bridge projects. Environmental <coughs> assessment revisions. Upon successful natural and cultural resources, review and public involvement plan. The environmental assessment will need to be revised to incorporate the modifications proposed and submitted for the Federal Highway Administration proposal. Finding of no significant impact. The formal meeting and the request of the Federal Highway Administration to seek concurrence was never conducted and will need to be completed after the second public hearing and submission to the final environmental assessment. 
kinding of necessity meeting, a formal meeting where the special committee overseeing the public hearings will review and express concerns and determine if there is a necessity for the project. The department requested and received a time extension from the Federal Highway Administration to complete the preliminary design by December 31st, 2023. We are hopeful that the City of Concord will reach consensus on the proposal to refine and update the preferred alternative and complete the preliminary design and environmental assessment. Upon successful completion of the preliminary design, the department can begin final design and right-of-way acquisitions in 2024, and begin addressing the pri priority projects included in the safety issues by 89 exit 1 and the exit 15 area red listed bridges. The Bow Concord project is critically important to addressing the existing and future local and regional needs along both I-93 and I-89 corridors. As such, the department is committed to moving this project into final design and construction in a timely manner. We seek the city's written support on the proposed alternative discussed with the city council on October 11th, 2022 in moving the project forward. Thank you for your time and attention. The project is sincerely Jason M. Ayotte, um, Eng professional engineer, project manager. Okay, so we all got it. We all Good. Um, anybody have any questions? <clears throat> Good. Uh, with that, let's open up the public hearing and uh, we are encouraged to see as many people here and help share uh, whatever your hopes and dreams are. Yep. Suzanne, she beat you by that much. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. Good evening. All of you again. My name is Judith Kurtz. I am a resident of Ward 5 with my husband and two children. Thank you all very much for your dedication to the city and to your hard work on behalf of all Concord citizens. We know you do so much more than ever gets attention or that we get to see at these um, meetings. So thank you for your time and for the opportunity to speak tonight. I'm here on behalf of the Concord Green Space Coalition to share a brief summary of our position and to give voice to a few of the responses from among the 100 comments we've received from residents in all 10 wards that are relevant to this project. Uh, first, we want you to know that we understand that working with the state on this project is necessary and that it is an opportunity. We are very encouraged by Mr. Ayat's proposal for updated traffic studies and public hearings. That was really encouraging to hear those, right, those ideas just now. Um, we advocate for the city to encourage the state through this process to make plans that do not preclude elements we value, such as a deck park, pedestrian bridge, realignment of the rail, a waterfront park, and a revitalized store street, all of which are ideas that were part of the city's vision since 2005, and we know that Mr. Cashman has written an updated statement. We believe that the city should engage a specialty planning firm to um, pursue these ideas, simply because the 2006 vision is no longer viable doesn't mean there aren't options that we could pursue. We also acknowledge that the I-93 project is not only about Concord. It is a major transportation corridor serving many New Hampshire towns and cities, providing an essential means for the movement of goods and a pathway for tourist dollars to move to areas north and south of our capital city. Our hope is that we can collaborate with New Hampshire DOT to achieve what is necessary with the expansion to meet those statewide needs while including the needs and vision of Concord residents in the planning and execution of any I-93 project. We ask that you, City Council, hold the Department of Transportation to the guiding principle adopted by the City of Concord as part of the 2020 visioning process, transportation that serves the community. We believe that in order for NHDOT to truly make sure that I, the I-93 plans serve our entire community, including residents who are not car dependent, a few things must happen. We wish to scale back the project by removing the auxiliary lanes so we go from four to six lanes, not up to eight. We would like to see the impact of designated speed on this plan and recommend a slower speed limit at 55 miles per hour. We would like to see more accommodation and safety considerations for bicyclists and pedestrians, including ADA compliant crossings, especially around multi-lane exits. This project should include separated bike lanes, not next to mixed with car traffic on major commuting routes. 
Much has changed in the world and in Concord since 2019, so we request workshops and charrettes so the Concord community can be fully able to participate in the development of the project, which sounds like it might dovetail nicely with DOT's proposal for more public hearings. We want plans that clearly demonstrate transitions that tell drivers they are leaving the highway and entering a low speed or neighborhood environment. We would like high quality streetscaping and landscaping at all interchanges. And we would like all plans to acknowledge and demonstrate a commitment to creating space for the Deck Park and Pedestrian River Bridge or similar improvement opportunity and other city goals as mentioned earlier. We believe very strongly that if we do not consider these elements for our city now, we will lose a once in a decade's opportunity to do so. When the state moves forward with the I-93 expansion, they will do so either creating and protecting space for a vision that benefits Concord or effectively shutting it down with development that robs us of the opportunity to improve and connect Concord for all residents. <clears throat> I'd like to share just a few responses from the community feedback that we received. Um, from Ward 10, if I-93 must be widened, let's not cause it to turn Concord into a gross, polluted, trafficy place. Let's expand and connect our green space and make it an even better place to live. From Ward 9, um, as a homeowner and taxpayer since 1979, I would be willing to see taxes increase to benefit improving anything, to benefit anything to improve river access for residents. I would not want to see tax increases to benefit the core I-93 expansion project. From Ward 8, I have been drawn to the feeling of community that Concord has cultivated and that's why I moved here. Um, this is not just a New Hampshire city, it is the capital of our state. It deserves some attention. Let's have some pride. Uh, from Ward 7, Concord is the perfect stopping point for travelers heading up 89 or continuing up 93. Um, if we are able to provide eye-catching parks with invitations for biking, walking, hanging out by the water, um, it will draw people to live here, work here, visit here, and invest here. Main Street is awesome. Let's keep going and make this city rocket. Um, from Ward 6, if we remember our talks back when we were talking about Main Street, do we keep the street four lanes or do we reduce it to two and do, to induce community? Our decision was right on that one and can be here as well. From Ward 5, I have lived on both sides of the Merrimack and would love to see the city more integrated and less divided. Build a family-friendly waterfront area to connect both sides of our city. From Ward 4, I would love to see a deck park created. It could be used in many ways by our community. Please consider bike traffic. Adding more lanes historically does not reduce traffic. Seriously, it never works. Um, from Ward 3, I do worry about the further separation caused by the highway in our city. I want the project to improve our city and resources and not be a detriment to them. From Ward 2, Deck Park. Bridges do not provide a safe place for citizens. And from Ward 1, um, there's nothing currently attractive about exit 14 or 13 to get people to visit downtown. Let's change that. There are so many more thoughtful, informed, and impassioned comments that we have received. I sincerely hope that you take the time to read them and to reach out to your constituents as you consider your response to the state. I'd like to leave space for the many other um, informed and passionate folks who are here tonight to speak to details and considerations that I'm not equipped to. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. Anybody have any questions? Thank you. Thank you for coming out. Um, I just had a question. Um, the comments about making it more inviting. I wonder, I wonder if you could give us an example of an exit on any New Hampshire interstate that you can think of that you think is inviting. Is inviting. Hmm, that's a great question. I would love if any of our team has specifics. Off the top of my head, I think there are some good examples of places I was just reading. Um, <clears throat> There's a part of Manchester where, at least from the highway, you're seeing the river, you're seeing across the river to inviting retail spaces. I'm thinking of the like converted um, mill buildings, right, which some of them house museums now um, and other things. So as opposed to what we see, you know, on the back of Store Street. Um, so part of it is just visual, what we see, and then also um, if getting off when you get off rather than being under a bridge, seeing graffiti, seeing people who are waiting to cross in like a dark space. If you are coming into a greenscape, um, you're seeing wider pedestrian walkways, things that actually look like you might want to get out of your car and walk around. 
other folks are going to add to that, I'm sure. But that's off the top of my head. Thank you. You're welcome. Who else? Okay. Appreciate your time. Thanks Thank so much. Thank you very much. Good evening. Welcome. Good evening. Um, I'm Suzanne Smith Meyer. Um, I'm on the planning board, but a longtime resident of Concord. And I thought that was a great segue for me. Um, I just wanted to remind people that in 1993, and please don't do the math, um, I was part of a design team that worked on the Merrimack River Charette. And it was a initiative sponsored by the National Park Service through their Scenic Rivers and Water um, Act. And it was about three days, I think. It was hard for me to remember exactly. Um, but there were landscape architects and planners uh, that were local, that were involved. That report is available in the public library in the Concord Room, if anyone in, is interested in looking at it. But one of the things that um, was important about it, it was an initiative that wanted to prepare Concord for this day. At the time, I didn't think it would take 30 years, but in retrospect, I'm kind of glad because <coughs> it is a very difficult discussion for people to have. Um, and not. A lot has changed, but the concepts are the same. Um, there were two options that were offered, option A, and I don't know, Jim, do you remember this? No, okay. <laughs> now you're really making me feel Oh, old. no. <laughs> Sorry. Um, close, really close. Well, uh, option A, and I don't, you probably don't even remember, 1993 was a very long time ago, but during that period, um, the city of Providence uh, moved the highway to better connect with um, the bay, the water, and um, Boston, you know, did the big dig, and Hartford, there are a lot of communities moving highways to better serve their communities. So our option A was to connect um, 89 to 393 and go through Manchester Street and go on the bluffs and connect with 393, so you're actually freeing up the river for downtown. Um, extreme, we're not a big city, but that was a vision that we thought was worth presenting. And the other option was doing what's being talked about now, but the important thing was even 30 years ago, um, we were being asked to think of what the city wanted, what the community wanted, and a lot has not changed. There's a lot that's similar. In Providence, they have one of these park decks that has been around for a very long time. It connects the, um, the east side Wickenden Street area with Fox Point across, and it's still very viable. Um, but I think one of my biggest concerns is, you know, in this planning phase, which, I mean, I mean it could take 20 years for this to be done, um, or even longer because it took 30 years to get this far is that we go through this process and the things that the community really wants ends up maybe towards the end getting pushed aside because of costs associated with the construction and you know whatever starts to happen so I'm just hoping that the community and um, our city government will really focus on not only how much of this highway do we need expanded? Um, just aside, I think David Brooks did a really good analysis in the Concord Monitor maybe a month and a half ago about, you know, the amount of traffic and the amount of money and is this really worth spending just for some, you know, crowded weekends? Um, I don't know if anyone's considered when we used to have the big uh, NASCAR races, um, which I would try to get out of town when that happened. But they would actually steal a lane from one, you know, steal a southbound lane, steal a northbound lane. And for a weekend, it worked very well. So, you know, maybe that's an option that can still be um, explored during those busy holiday weekends. But if we want improvements, that comes with federal dollars. So what everyone's been waiting for is an improvement to 93 that can help fund some of these improvements and access. We're kind of still distant from the Merrimack River, and it's a wonderful resource and um, thing that is, will really 
providing the access will really help the community. So it's kind of like you have to take the good with the bad, but I think I would also support not having too many lanes, because right now with the two lanes, the traffic is still really, really, really fast. And I think it's more dangerous when there are three lanes. But looking at this as a holistic project, it's not just the widening, but it's the things that give us an opportunity to make that connection stronger and not separate us from the river. So please go to the library and look at the report. Councilor Keach. One question. Uh, thank you for your testimony. As a resident of East Concord, have you experienced, and the manager brought this up last month, the displacement of all that traffic on the weekends down Mountain Road, down Fisherville Road, down East um, Long Pond Road. Have you experienced that in East Concord? Well, I'm, I, um, I'm right at the uh, roundabout, pretty close. And, and that, I waited 10 years for that, and it's the best thing that's ever happened to East Concord. I took forever. We tried. Um, they didn't cut some of the landscaping out, which is nope, much to but, my chagrin. Uh, but I would say, yes, I've noticed but Specifically, it. my question is, like, either you expand the highway or that traffic is is dispersed into the side streets? Well, well, no. <clears throat> I don't think that that's necessarily the case because I think one of the problems that we have, I look at Sewell's Falls, um, that that is a, a great opportunity for people from Fisherville Road to get on the highway and not go down Mountain Road instead of going down, you know, I think they have these like half inter exits. Um, that I think could help. I'm not sure what Store Street will do, but I think when you live in the neighborhood, you just adapt to Sundays and Fridays. And it's really not a Friday problem except when you're going north. But for the Sundays, I think if you live on Mountain Road, it's bad. But even the state, you know, they don't get on the highway at 393. They come through the roundabout and get on the highway in East Concord. And I have friends that live on East Side Drive, and they really feel it on right. Sundays and during like at four o'clock in the afternoon, you really feel it. So I don't think that that's the solution okay. for widening the highway. Yeah. No. Thank you. Good answer. Thank you. Brown. Hi. Yes. I would just. What was the title of that? Merrimack uh, River Charette. Merrimack River Charette. Thank you. 1993. It's a good year. Wild and scenic rivers. What? Wild and Scenic Rivers Act. Yes. Sure. Everybody all set? Thank you very much, and uh, congratulations, by the way. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so just to follow up on Suzanne's comments, that, that study was provided if, to give a little history on this project. This project was originally supposed to start construction in 2006 and be completed in 2008. So the planning for this has been going on that's why Gene looks the way he does for 20 years. That study, <laughs> that's two. That study that's was, two. was reviewed by city staff cool. and provided, <laughs> provided to the that, Hampshire DOT. Yeah. And what the plan was, and that was actually one of the city's preferred alternatives, was to actually take um, I-89, run it through over the river, through Garvin's Falls, to develop that 1,000 acres of industrial property, and tie into the town of Pembroke. The town of Pembroke was in favor of that. But looking at it from the environmental and the historical perspectives, it would never it would never receive approval from the Federal Highway Administration, EPA, or anybody else. So that whole thing was reviewed in, in completely, and that was the city's push to do that. The second push after that one was dismissed was not dismissed isn't the right word was disqualified was to actually take the I-93 plan as Suzanne said and move it closer to, towards downtown through the plaza, through the Bricksmore Plaza, through the Unitil site, through Ralph Pill. That was the other proposal for the plan, and that was supported by the community to do that. Again, the impact of that was so dramatic that it has been, that, it, that proposal has been rejected too. So that study has been provided, DOT has that study, Gene McCarthy has that study, and we've looked at all that, so there's nothing there's nothing new there that you can provide to the state that they haven't already seen or reviewed for over the last 20 years. It's worth a read. Okay. Um, back here next. Yep, yep. Sorry. Good evening and welcome. Oh, took an airing with it, though. 
up. <laughs> and it's going to take the other. Um, hi there. Uh, my name is Tess McMahon. I am a relatively new uh, resident of Concord. I've been here for five years. My husband and I moved here when he went to law school. Um, and our plan is we would like to raise our family here in Concord. We've been living uh, in Ward 6, I mean, literally around the corner for five, uh, going on five years now. Um, I have some concerns with the expansion of the highway. I think it's an amazing opportunity, so I'm going to talk about my concerns, then I'll finish with things that I'm excited for. Um, first, I am pretty concerned about um, the health impacts of the highway on our community. Um, for instance, um, highways increase the number of particulates in the air, including ultrafine particulates, which lodge inside human, I mean, everybody's lungs, but here I suppose we're mostly concerned with human lungs. Um, and having an increased highway and having that increased exposure, um, when those environmental assessments are done, I'd be really interested to see how the state is planning to mitigate those health, uh, health impacts on the community. Um, I'm also concerned with the, the noise, of, noise elevation of having an expanded highway. Um, an eight lane highway or a six lane highway is not typically a slow countryside highway that um, people meander through. People tend to gun it through that highway. And even on 93 as it is, people gun it down that highway. Um, so I also have safety concerns um, with a six or eight lane highway for humans as well as for uh, animals that inevitably will try and cross. Um, I know that you, last time I chatted uh, with you guys, you mentioned that uh, there are wildlife crossings, but that is another safety concern as well for humans. Um, now, as far as um, other concerns, I am concerned that a bigger highway would further separate east from west. Um, I mean, a lot of the points that Concord Green Space made, I am affiliated with them. These are my own thoughts, not their thoughts. Um, and I'm worried that it will make Concord less bike friendly as it is. I mean, in the last month, I've really been paying more attention um, since I last, I spoke with the TPAC uh, group, and I've seen people going the wrong way on Loudoun. Um, you know, bikers on the wrong side of Loudoun Road almost getting hit. I've seen tons of kids. I love seeing kids on bikes. I hate seeing kids on bikes around a lot of traffic. Um, so that brings me to the things that I'm really excited for. I'm really excited that this project has the possibility of connecting East Concord to West Concord. I'm really excited that this will allow Concord the opportunity to potentially realize those projects that they envisioned back in apparently 1993 <laughs> when my sister was born. Um, so I am excited for that. Um, I'm also really excited, and I know that there has been talk about rail system. Um, what I would love to see is if this highway expansion does happen, first, I don't know if it needs to happen. I agree. It, it, I, I don't think this is... Um, Expanding the highway has not been shown to reduce traffic. Um, but if it is expanded, I would love to see a groundwork for a rail system going down to Boston. Um, if the goal is to get more people through New Hampshire faster, a rail system is the way to go. It's better for the environment, it's faster, it's safer. There's a lot of reasons to, to do it. Um, and that would mitigate traffic concerns as well as um, a lot of the other concerns that it would have. Um, Let's see, I wrote all these notes, and of course, they're all discombobulated. Um, other things that I would like to see uh, is I would like to see us continue this goal of developing the waterway, um, just again to mimic uh, a lot of what people around here have said. Um, and I did think about, I think it was your question, sir, about um, a beautiful exit. So I have traveled a lot in the United States, I'm from the West, and some of the best places, I don't know if you guys have gotten to drive out there, but <laughs> what happens is you'll go, you know, for 100, 200, 300 miles, and it'll be desolate, and then you'll come and you'll be booking it down the highway at 70, 80 miles per hour, legally, of course, and you end up in these little towns, and it slows down, and you see 
whatever the town has, you know, maybe it's these beautiful rock faces, or maybe it's a river, or maybe it's, you know, whatever, whatever the town has to offer, the highway slows down, and you often will just meander through the town. So you'll go from like 80 miles an hour, and then you slow all the way down to 45 miles an hour, and then you go through these amazing downtowns. Now, that might not be the right solution for Concord, but if we're thinking about reimagining what Concord looks like, perhaps we have alternatives to the busy highway that people can go off, and all of a sudden they're in this beautiful town that we have. So um, those are the best exits I've seen. Um, but that is, I believe, all I had for you all. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. When you get on the highway, mm. um, where do you get on and where do you go to? Um, so typically, um, I, uh, I commute down to Boston, so I often will take the Concord coach line. So I believe that's, I'm not as 14. good as you, yeah, that is 14. Exit I'm 14. not as good as you guys with uh, which exit switch. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so typically I exit 14, sometimes exit 15, um, and I go back and forth across the highway uh, quite a bit. Um, and it's scary, I'll tell you. Go <laughs> that loud an intersection is horrific. Thank you. Mm. Anyone else? Appreciate you taking time tonight. Mm, thank you. Did you raise your hand last time? Next one. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. Uh, my name is Joel Eaton, and I am um, here on my own behalf. I, I serve as a chaplain um, at a uh, retirement community um, just on the other side of the river. Um, but I'm not here representing them. But I do bring experience uh, from that place and, um, and from my commutes which um, this year I've been riding my bicycle. I live near White Park, and I've been riding my bicycle to work uh, through that terrible intersection, um, which every day gives me a little bit of an elevated heart rate. Um, it is a, uh, and, it's, and it's a place also where I see other folks who don't have the option um, of uh, other forms of transportation using uh, bicycles or walking, um, sometimes going down sidewalks, sometimes going on the road, sometimes in the right direction, sometimes in the wrong direction. Um, I've heard many, many stories of people you know, warning me not to commute to work by bicycle. Um, and yet I do that partly out of a consideration for my own personal economics, partly out of ecological concerns, partly out of um, <laughs> wanting to build an exercise to my very limited time of a day. Um, I also know residents at the retirement community who walk to their churches across town. So walking through that terrible intersection. Um, I walk, um, and, I, and I know others who, who don't. And it's, I think this, this issue is about opportunity costs. It's a, it's a consideration, again, Concord is a city that if it is to have transportation that serves all the people, it needs to take into consideration um, all of the, all the dis disabled Concord residents, all of the residents who don't have the option to um, even afford public transport um, or to, um, to use other means besides bicycles or walking. Um, so here's the advantage, if, if we were to build a deck park, if we were to build these ways of binding together across the river, you have possibilities of bringing people, and we're not just talking about beautifying the city, which would happen, not just about tourists coming through that intersection and seeing it, that would happen, but about people coming from across the river, being able, many more people who, who are just sheerly limited by transportation. And it's, you know, it's not a small, it's a small distance, but it's a great distance because of the way that it's set up. You'd have just a blending of people. You'd have economic um, gains. You'd have social gains. You'd have integration of a community. Um, and you'd have new possibilities that you can't even imagine to bring culture and life um, and make and a vibrancy to Concord. Um, so I speak from my own experience as a commuter 
and all the observations I have as I'm kind of panting up loud and road. Um, but I also speak as someone who, I live in Ward 4. Um, I have a six-year-old son in the Concord Public Schools. And I, I intend to live in this city uh, for the rest of um, however long I can. I love it here. Um, I, I hope to be a chaplain at the retirement community for a good while. And so I have a real investment in wanting to see these two worlds brought together and to seeing it made safe for everyone. And I think that's a justice concern, an ethics concern, an ecological concern, um, and one that I think is just, again, we, we also heard earlier about carbon neutrality. Um, so let's think about a plan for this city that doesn't simply do what we've done for the last 50 so years and prioritize the interests of car drivers and um, car transportation. Um, so I, I really think it's important that we um, consider all the options, don't limit ourselves, don't get locked in to an infrastructure that down the run um, will prevent possibilities for our environment, for our city, for our people um, that are just, in my, in my estimation, the right um, um, vision for this city. So. Don't, don't go away yet. Oh, right, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody have questions? So, um, so uh, this, first of all, thank you very much for your testimony. really appreciate you um, sharing your thoughts. Um, I sit on the bike ped committee as well, and I'm just kind of curious. We had a long conversation about um, the different types of bike riders and, you know, what roads do they use and why do they use them and getting to certain destinations and all that kind of things. Yeah. I'm going to make an assumption. If you're going to the east side, you're probably going somewhere around Eastside Drive or maybe Christian Ave. <laughs> Good assumption, yeah. Okay. So I, right. I, 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 do, I actually do two routes. I do Loudon Road when I'm going to one of, one of the campuses, and when I'm going to the other campus on Eastside Drive, I go around the Technical College. So that's my question. So I lived over there for 20 plus years, and whenever I rode from my house to downtown, I always run, you know, basically down Eastside Drive, Portsmouth Street and such. I just couldn't figure out why you would go that way. So and I do, do go, go that way, do. yeah. But you know, and it's, it's actually safer, isn't it? it's safer. It's also there's a beast of a hill on Portsmouth Road. <laughs> well, the Loudon Road. And go, go it's, it's worse than it's definitely worse than Loudon. You look also, like you look like you're cheap though. You well, like yeah. I mean, I've definitely gotten. <laughs> I mean, there. I, not me. I, I appreciate the compliment, you, 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 but I'm not going to let you avoid this concern <laughs> of mine, <laughs> which is <laughs> which is that I'm not the only one that would use these these pathways. Um, and I might be interested in the exercise I get off of Portsmouth, Ro Portsmouth Road. Um, but I'm definitely not interested in that every day. Um, and I think that it's important for us to consider that, like, where, where we are, right across the road, is a huge neighborhood of new Americans. And those folks are dependent on walking and other modes of traffic, a lot of them until they can fully kind of become um, able to navigate the, uh, you know, the driver's license, the, all, all these things. So I think it's really important for us to consider that um, this interchange, I mean, we've got just a few places across the river, and, and those that are able to can go around the technical college, um, but not everyone is able to do that. And I, the retirement community folks that, that walk downtown because they can't drive anymore, they can't go, they wouldn't go all the way around the college, that would exhaust them. Mm -hmm. It's a much more direct route to go down Loudoun Road to get to downtown. So I think it's, it's true that those two are there, one is definitely safer, um, but one could be made a lot safer. And that's the opportunity we have, I think, in development. Again, thank you, and we do have a bike pedestrian subcommittee that I would love to have you come and share your thoughts with at times. When is that meet? Uh, you know what? You leave your information with the clerk, and I'll make sure you get the. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate it. I, I uh, had his hand next, and then we'll come back over here. And then we'll go back over there. Good evening. Welcome. Good evening, Mayor Boulay, members of the City Council, <clears throat> Madam Clerk. Uh, my name is Tim Sink. I'm president of the Greater Concord Chamber of Commerce. And uh, great testimony tonight, and um, <clears throat> I want to express my appreciation to city staff and city council for advocating on behalf 
of the city on this project over years. I think we've seen some improvements over original designs. Wouldn't have happened without um, the hard work of many. So, so thank you so much for that. This is an issue that the Chamber's been looking at for years. Um, and so I, I just want to make three quick points that, um, uh, that, that are of great interest to us. One of them is that we would really like to see this project result in some improvements of the image of uh, downtown Concord from Interstate 93. We don't have our best foot forward there right now. We all know that. Um, years ago, we ran a, a community charrette. We called it Concord's New Front <coughs> Door, and it looked at ways to improve that image. And some of the ideas that came out were things like um, landscaping improvements, which are not going to break the bank, um, decorative fencing, strategically placed, lighting treatments that can entice people into the city, uh, and other creative ideas that just improve the image of downtown Concord from Interstate 93. So th that's point one. Point two, another relatively inexpensive thing that we can do, is improved uh, wayfinding and signage that talks, tells a little bit of the story of downtown Concord. Get, getting people off the highway, letting them know we've got great shopping, we've got entertainment, we've got great restaurants. What can we do? We've got a lot of traffic passing through Concord. We're leaving some dollars on the table there, and I think improving the uh, signage and wayfinding would help there. And the third point, and it's something that's been discussed quite a bit from other testimony, is the concept of a deck or a meaningful way of connecting downtown to the river and possibly some public green space. Um, specifically, I know there's been some discussion about doing a feasibility analysis of this concept. We would definitely support that. Um, this is a one-time opportunity to do something really big, and we'd love to see this, um, this idea vetted thoroughly. So um, hope that uh, the city would support that initiative, and I thank you again for some opportunity to testimony tonight. Thank you. Anybody have questions? Anything else? Good to see you. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, Councilors, Mr. Manager, Madam Clerk. Forgive me if I'm a little nervous. Um, my name is Steve Winnett. I'm a Concord resident of about 27 years. And I was here at one of the recent meetings about <coughs> I-93. I testified about the value of access to the river. And I've had a lot more time to think about it. Um, during and since, my wife and I took a delayed 25th anniversary trip to Europe this fall. Uh, and I've thought a lot about what, that, what I saw might mean for Concord. And in the process of seeing a couple of rivers, several cities, I noticed that rivers and the bridges over them and the space next to them are centers of commerce, they're gathering places, they're places of cultural exchange, and they're places that people used to exercise. As far as centers of commerce is concerned, I saw many, many instances where bridges and the areas around bridges and rivers had lots of food service, active art going on, whether it's people making money sketching other people and doing caricatures, or selling lots of arts and crafts. Um, places where performances are taking place, whether there are people performing to make some money or people just performing because they're looking to express their musical um, abilities and, and love. Um, as gathering places, there are places that seniors, senior citizens are walking and socializing. Youth and kids and parents are gathering with their kids playing. Um, and whether in Europe or in this country, and other cities I've been in in the United States, what I've seen testifies to one simple fact, and that is that people are the same everywhere in that they want to be close to water. Anywhere you go, people just want to be close to the water. So along the Danube River from Budapest and Vienna up into Germany and in Salzburg, everywhere that there's a town or a city next to a river, there's a trail or a path along the river, and people are using them. <coughs> sometimes a little, sometimes a lot. But there's always a place next to the river that people are using. And if there are enough people around said city or said town, there are businesses that are doing business. Um, 
In the small city of Regensburg, Germany, for example, there's a very, very old bridge. I think it dates back to the 12th century. They call it the Stone Bridge. And it's wide, and it's very long because from downtown over the Danube and the many tributaries and channels, it's a good quarter of a mile, to, and it links the city far on the other side to the downtown. And could be a quarter of a mile, I'm not quite sure, but there are people going back and forth across the bridge between the sides of the city, people gathering, people playing music, and my favorite thing about, about this particular bridge is on the city side, the downtown side of the bridge, there's a business, it's a sausage and beer place, that they say dates back to when the builders of the bridge had a canteen there. So this place has been there for 800 years, feeding people, giving them sausages and beer. Sausages are really good, by the way. Uh, and the place is packed all the time. Um, and the same thing in, in Prague. We spend a little time in Prague. There's a very old bridge there. Um, it's called the Charles Bridge. It's quite wide. There are people selling crafts. There are people gathering, playing music. And it's always packed. And it has the same artistry, the same people, a couple countries away, drawing pictures of other people. And there are people on the banks of the rivers. And I've noticed anywhere in these cities where you have a large open space that has some kind of a feature that draws people in, the kids will be playing. There'll be food and drink services all close by. If they weren't there already, they probably came because there were so many people around. When I was here last time, I talked about Oregon, uh, Portland, Oregon, and San Antonio's very successful riverfronts. But there are places a lot closer to home that are very good examples. For instance, uh, someone mentioned Prov uh, Providence, Rhode Island. And I started doing some research when I got home from this trip and found that Providence has this brand new um, pedestrian bridge, the, the Michael Van Leesten Memorial Pedestrian Bridge. It has this modern, unique design that allows for bump outs where people can stand and there are benches and there are even built-in chess tables. I'm told that um, it's the center of a festival where they set <coughs> burning baskets that are floating on the river and it's part of a festival that takes place place at night and draws many, many people in. The bridge links two neighborhoods, uh, the Fox Point neighborhood and the Jewelry District, which otherwise would be quite far apart down at the bottom of the Providence River. This is downstream from the center of Providence, which already has a huge, somewhat new riverfront. And then you come a little closer and you get to Boston and the Charles River. That's a great example. The Nice Shift Brewery, for example, has two beer gardens on the river. One down uh, in the boat basin, near where the start of the, uh, the head of the Charles Regatta is, and one up by the finish line of the Charles River, uh, of the Regatta. There are boat houses renting paddle boats and canoes. There are public docks. There's a roof bar, it's called the Over the Charles, um, and it's on a hotel that overlooks the least attractive stretch of the river, and even so, there are people who gather on a rooftop to overlook the river. Um, there's the Weeks Footbridge. There are concerts at the band show. Um, the Trillium Brewery has a beer garden, and there's another wine garden on the Rose Kennedy Greenway, which, while not right, right next to the river, is another large gathering space. So there are, you, you create places for people, especially along rivers, and commerce and people and social activity follows. And they become drawing places that become famous all around. Um, and you can, can come a little closer, too. I belong to a boat club down in Hooksit. And if you know the area, you'll know that there is now a <coughs> river walk that starts right at my boathouse, which is behind a dog walking park, which is behind the courthouse. And this is not a place that's close to anything. It's in the middle of nowhere. There's a large parking lot for the boat uh, ramp that's there. And there are always people there. There are always people parking and walking on this uh, river path. And as I said, it's not close to anything. And people have to come a fair distance to go to, to, go to it. And there are always people there. Um, 
you can find studies about the economic value of rivers, riverfronts online. Um, here's one that I particularly liked. If you've been in Paris, you'll know that the Seine River flows through the middle of Paris with high stone walls on either side. And there are roadways inside of those stone walls right along the river that about the early two, 2000s, the city of Paris closed at some great expense to traffic. But they had this idea about drawing people to the river by creating linear parks on either side of the river within those big stone walls. <coughs> and um, they call them the French word for beach, which is plage. And they called them the plages. In fact, they even trucked in a lot of sand to create beaches along parts of these now closed roadways. Um, and a commentator said about this, and this is a quote. I have I've translated a couple of French words. The plage creates a sense of urban community. Entrance is free, and most of its amenities, the fleet of well-maintained loader bikes and even the board games, are either low cost or free too. People from every neighborhood and social background can be find, found here. It's easy to reach by public transport, even from the <coughs> suburbs. The plage vigorously counteracts ethnic and class ghettoization. The, ha the plage has proved itself not only commercially viable, but a huge <coughs> moneymaker for the city. It pays for itself many times over. I invite you to think about what this vision could do for our city, both from a commerce point of view, economic development, social point of view, and beauty point of view. And by the way, I have photos and videos that I took if anyone is interested in talking to me after, afterwards. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Sounds great. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I don't want to put you on the spot, um, but we, it is our question time, and twice we've now had the, um, the bridge in Providence brought up mm -hmm. in between the time that um, <coughs> this, uh, Susan Smith Myers mentioned it and you. Google is a vast and wonderful place. Do you know how much it costs for the bridge? Several million. 22. Do you know how they paid for it? No. With an I-195 uh, redevelopment fund, which is similar to what we have for TIF districts here in the city. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thanks for your testimony. I appreciate Welcome. it. You're I'm sure you're all, I work for the Environmental Protection Agency, and one of the things that we've staffed up recently on is uh, the new bill funding, which creates billions of dollars <coughs> for infrastructure work. And every time I hear about the possibility of this project, I think about the possibility of applying for some of that. I can't be involved in it, obviously, but just an idea. The knowledge is good. Anything else? Sounds like you had a great trip. <laughs> My only concern about uh, the Providence Bridge is uh, I believe the uh, mayor went to jail when he moved the river, and <laughs> I, have no intention of, I have no intention of going to jail. <laughs> My impression is that the mayor went to jail for years and years of corruption, which seems to be endemic from what I've heard. Yes, I'm, I'm good, I'm good. Then. I, I, I wouldn't, <laughs> yeah, I come from Rhode Island, Your Honor, and I wouldn't worry. He got out of prison, he got reelected. So. <laughs> he's, still lo he's still loved. Anyways, thank you very much, Steve. Appreciate it. Good to see you. <laughs> Somebody over here. There you go. Yep. And then we're going to go here and back over there. Good evening and welcome. Good evening. If you wouldn't mind, there you go. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, it's a great honor to be with you here. My first time. I think so. Right. Um, uh, my name is Fisto Ndeshimie. Uh, I come from Democratic Republic of Congo, and uh, I've lived here for five years, and uh, I live in Pentecost now. And uh, this is the community that uh, I think that uh, I'm gonna be able to live um, <coughs> I don't know, maybe for my entire life, but I think it's great. Um, so I'm here and uh, I speak on behalf of refugees and poor people 
since I come from that background. I'm a former refugee, um, which is uh, something that, uh, wow, it's something that is not talked about. And sometimes I feel, I feel pain about this because it pains me a lot. But I would take time to appreciate the gentleman over there. He spoke about it, and I do appreciate everybody who came here to speak on behalf of their community. And it's your job, I think, to pay attention and listen to what they say, because I think there's so much potential into their ideas. <coughs> and they do leave that. Well, my point, I want to speak about the, the experience I've had uh, with uh, some of the refugees uh, who lives on their side. I don't live there, but I do work with them and I do a lot to try to help them. Um, as a lead organizer of Change for Concord, I think there's a lot that I can do for the community, but I need the environment to become that person. And I haven't found one. Um, so I've sat down with some few young people and old people, um, new Americans, who still experience um, the pain that they've had back home. And I spoke about them and about the issues. And I've asked, I've asked them two or three questions about, you know, happiness. And my first question was, what makes you happy <coughs> now? Like, since you live in the United States, what makes you happy? And this woman, she stood up. Well, again, we were standing in a church. Um, and she stood up saying that I'm happy that I'm not worried that um, there's war and all these things that we, we faced back home. I'm happy that I have food stamp and I have a house, which is uh, th those houses that, that, are being, uh, that you guys provide for them. I don't know, public housing and stuff like that. Um, and I have kids, and I have my family here. Great, I was like, that's great. <coughs> and is that what makes you self? She said yes. Um, but the problem is that since I've started learning about the community, and try to become part of the community, become part of these old organizations and become part of you know, uh, organizing and reconstructions and uh, making changes, positive changes in the community. There's so much that's going on that's going to affect these people and none of those issues that are being talked about and I'm here to speak about that. And I, I do think that I have some friends here Maybe I'll make more. I don't know yet. Um, but I welcome you to think deeply about these people. Well, they do think they have everything they want, which is not what they need. Um, paying rent and paying house, I mean, uh, the, the, the car and paying their cell phones and, and think that, okay, I'm done. To me, it's not. While these young people deserve attention, they are poor and they are new to America, to, to the United States. And they, they, don't, they don't have any idea about what's going on in the system because it's very complicated. I don't know anything about this yet. I'm, 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 I'm still learning, and I have a good friends that are trying to help me get it. Again, again I've been here for five, for five years. I never spoke English before. 
I learned English here. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying. Um, so these young people deserve attention. When these, may, uh, when these, these decisions are being made, created, well, I ask you to think about the community, not your people. So when you, when, you talk, when you speak or when you talk about people, do you speak about my people or the people? That's a question. So because if you do speak about we the people, then you consider poor people, homelesses, and refugees that are living on the other side. So the highway that, it, that is it's being reconstructed, with redesigned, whatever they're doing right now, I don't know, um, which is something I'm going to learn. I'm sorry about that. Um, so my question is about, about that decision. The problems that um, these decisions are going, are going to create, do you know what we do with that? Because it's not, no longer your job. We deal with that. And these refugees are going to deal with those issues. And they have nobody to speak for them. They don't know what's going on. They don't know who to go to. They think they're happy because they have cars. Wow, 80% of them don't, if that's what you wanted to hear. 80% of them don't own bikes, even, even anything like that. So you want to divide the whole thing. They have no access to work, to, I mean, to work or get whatever they want in different areas. And again, think about our community downtown. It's very not diversity. There's no any colored restaurant or coffee shop or any business in downtown. You have all that money, but that's what you want to use it for. Again, that's going to create issues that everybody's going to be dealing with. And it's worse when it comes to refugees. And I'm not ready for that. Because I do, th I do think that we have true leaders here. And I ex expect you to make these changes when you think about every, everybody. I want you to think about new people, refugees, poor people, homelessness, when you make these changes. Again, the reason why I'm here is because I think you're great. If, I, if you, weren't, you weren't great, I wouldn't be here. The, the fact that I'm talking to you is because I, I see knowledge. I see great leaders. I see people that can create positive changes in our community. I see great leaders, true leaders. I see purpose. I see love. But again, I welcome you to think about my community. They are very poor, not just money-wise. No, knowledge, knowledge. They have ignorance, yes, I know that, and they have a responsibility to learn. But again, you have to take a first step as a leader to see what the need is. So I don't know what my mentor has to say about that. <laughs> um, but I, again, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Hi, I'm Jessica Livingston. I'm Fisto's mentor, and I live in Ward 4. And I'm a Concord groupie, as you all know. Um, I want to just piggyback on what Fisto was saying about the, the divide with the river and the lack of diversity downtown. Um, you know, I know that this is a very, we're lucky to be a very diverse community, but we're still not truly <coughs> diverse because we're still very segregated by not just the river, but you know, that's where the, all of the new Americans live up on the Heights. The US Census said that the Heights, the, that Loudoun Road was the most diverse neighborhood in all of New Hampshire, but yet we're really not capitalizing on that diversity because they're all just in the low income housing up there and they're not taking part in Concord's everyday life. Um, so on that, I want to also echo what s several other people said about, you know, we have the opportunity to bring people together, to use this project to bring people together from both sides of the river and create more opportunities for a connection, more cultural opportunities, economic opportunities. Um, 
I just, I hope that in all of this, which many people have said already, is that we really need to engage with the people whose voices aren't being heard, people with disabilities, people who are low income, um, people who lack transportation, especially refugees who don't, like Fisto said, they are, um, you know, they think that they've got it great, but they're still struggling and they came here to not struggle. Um, and they shouldn't have to, you know, ride bikes or walk so far and, and struggle um, just because they've been forgotten, but they don't think that it's um, a big deal. Um, and then also with the environmental impacts and healthy living, um, just like somebody said about the golf carts, like why are we not looking at environmentally friendly initiatives? Um, so I just really hope that I know this is such a huge project, um, but I just really hope that the city, as you tend to try to do, um, does that intentional outreach to the co to the communities and, and hears the voices that aren't being heard. And we're here to help. You, you have partners in the city with different organizations. I would just really encourage you to connect with the leaders in these specific communities and try really hard to connect with all of the communities and hear from them and not just the usual people who show up to all of these meetings and charrettes and public hearings. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Councilor. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I, I applaud you for coming and speaking with the council and I more so applaud you for all that you have done in the last five years to um, connect with the, our community staying with our community and so much that you have um, advanced yourself in the connections that you've made here and Ms. Livingston is a wonderful connection in our community and I'm sure she's helped wonderfully. You mentioned the multi-layered um, complexities of running the city. This is not new to just our refugee community. We see this often with our elderly and during the pandemic we saw it worst and every counselor at the table saw most specifically how many people were disconnected with how complicated it was to do something as simple as paying a water bill, paying your um, property taxes, registering your car, the simple things that we thought it was so easy we just walk into City Hall and we were able to take care of, we couldn't do that anymore. I want to assure you that there have been long plans with the Merrimack River Greenway Trail to connect by bicycle, pedestrian, multimodal use. One of the um, food waste areas that we have in our, our city, it's an oasis, which is over in Ward 8 on Manchester Street. They have no grocery store. They have no transportation to get to a grocery store. This project incorporates um, connecting that area of the city, but it also includes improvements for the people on the Heights to have better access to the downtown. The city here only has a certain portion that we can do. The state needs to listen as well. And so I, I trust and I hope that you'll have the confidence that we at the table carry that voice forward to the state on your behalf. We don't get to run all the charrettes. We just get to give our opinion on their project. But thank you for your testimony, and I apologize. The, my question was, would you believe? <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Gotcha. Thanks, Your Honor. Uh, Fisto and, and Jessica, would you believe that I'm really pleased to see you here? Uh, would you believe uh, that uh, I would suggest that you keep in mind that, that you don't have to just wait for opportunities like this to communicate how this project or, or any other project in the city is impacting members of our new American community or, or anyone in, in, in your neighborhood. Uh, there is uh, open access to pretty much every, every city councilor around the table. I know you guys know how to get in touch with me. Um, and, uh, you know, I think we all welcome uh, input suggestions if there are people that, you know, who need to be heard. Uh, there are, you know, this city council is ready to work, you know, to, to hear them. Um, but uh, as, as much as us reaching out, you know, people can reach in and we can find a way uh, to hear and to listen to how any of these projects are affecting members of our new American communities, 
members of our uh, uh, BIPOC community, uh, the elderly, uh, you know, everyone. But thanks, thanks so much for coming in tonight. Can I comment that, Mayor? Of course. Yeah, um, I do appreciate your, I don't know, questions? Um, but I think uh, th there's so many people that reached out many times and had, had meetings with you guys about this. You're aware of that? Trying to maybe, sometimes you gotta accept that, you know, you're not, no, nobody get, never ever get old to learn. You always learn. And I think that the community has tried so hard many times to try to do that, like educate our leaders about so much when it comes to equity and uh, inclusion, the diversity. And sometimes I have discussions with people when they talk about diversity and I'm like, what are you talking about diversity? Like, you just wanna, you know, we do know that we have people, new people in our community. Maybe now the, the increase is high, which is great, but that, to me, that's not diversity. We do need systemic diversity. So if I were to become part of the something, right, it won't work. It would never work unless you take a responsibility and break that system down to work on me and create that environment where I can exercise my rights and my ideas. That's what I'm talking about. And I think the, uh, the community has done a great job trying to communicate with you guys about these issues and you're aware of that and you know what they think about it. But again, I'm just gonna calm myself down. I do appreciate that you try so hard to work with the community and the fact that you called us and accepted that we become part of this meeting, it tells me that we do see great greatness in you. And I see that. I, I, I recognize that. So thank you. Anyone else? Sounds proud. I'd just like to say thank you to Ms. Livingston and uh, Mr. Ndeshimiye for, for coming here. I know it's pretty brave of you to come forward and speak, you know, having not spoken English. I don't know that I could comfortably speak before a public body after only learning a foreign language for f after five years. It's amazing. And, and you're absolutely right. We need to do better. And I pledge that we will work hard to include uh, our entire community and fight the systemic racism that is part of our system, now, that is part of our um, government now. Thank you. Thank you. Is this uh, about the interstate? Hmm? Is this about the interstate? It is actually. Right. <laughs> I say thank you for, um, for coming tonight and echo a lot of what my fellow counselors um, said. Would you believe that um, what many of us might think of refugees as fleeing from uh, war-torn countries, that the Red Cross actually estimates that more, or more refugees are coming because of the rise in um, global warming and climate change and because of the environmental factors, including things like um, fossil, burning fossil fuels and other things. And as we talk about projects like the interstate widening, and community priorities that it's important to take into account not just what our local community would see and the impact on local public health here, but also what's happening around the world and our small role in how we address what we want our community to look like, but also what we want our world to look like. Would you believe? That? I think they I shook their heads all night. <laughs> Anyone else? Well, thank you both for coming. I appreciate it. Uh, I had some. Welcome, welcome back. Evening. Hi, uh, Ian McGregor, Ward Seven. Um, uh, thank you guys for sticking around late. Um, I had some comments as as we've been going around. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, Alderman Tennessee, you had uh, uh, mentioned a comment to uh, uh, Judith earlier about uh, a welcoming um, entrance ramp. And I, I think that's kind of like an oxymoron, uh, akin to you know a playground built for a pickup truck. 
uh, they don't mesh. Um, but we do have the problems when those two things do come together, where you build uh, interstate entrance ramps that appear to be welcoming. Um, and unfortunately, that's caused death in our community with the 393 entrance ramp that has sidewalk on both sides, but people use it to get to necessary facilities in our community. And it's not a welcoming place if you're outside of a car. Um, so uh, I, I just wanted to, um, you know, uh, to, to Judah's point, that's, it's, it's uh, in, my, in my opinion, it was an unfair question. Um, I also, to uh, the gentleman who worked for the EPA, as well as uh, Susan, who spoke earlier about uh, Providence um, and all of the cities of Europe that have done such a great job of connecting to their waterway. Um, we don't have to look to Europe or even Rhode Island to look at communities that have connected to their waterway. Um, Manchester, I think, is, is doing it. They're trying. It's going super slow. Um, but it, it's happening. Um, Exeter is, uh, they just finished their library. Um, that looks really good. Uh, looks over, overlooks their waterway. Um, and then Franklin, are you kidding me? Has anybody been to Franklin recently? The whitewater, they literally have a whitewater park that's in the river. When we were build, talking about the deck park through TPAC and some of the green space meetings, it's, you know, what does connection to the water mean? That's as literal as you can get. You're physically in the water. So in my opinion, connection to the water can mean whatever we want it to mean as a community, but it's whether or not we decide if we even want to go that route. Um, also, I'm, I'm going to talk fast because I know we're late, but I'm going to try. Um, uh, to uh, the gentleman's point in the green sweater, uh, riding on Loudoun Road, um, I, until recently, uh, drove everywhere. But uh, be, I, I got a, a new bike. It's got a motor on it. It's fantastic. And you know, I wanted to see what it's like to ride up Loudoun Road. That's terrifying. Um, I also know it's illegal to ride on the sidewalk. So I'm doing my due du duty, and I'm I'm following the law and the bike lanes that guide you there. And I'm riding um, along Loudoun Road, and it's it's awful. <laughs> um, but at the same time, there are people driving or riding that you see riding the sidewalk, and you know, maybe I'm being stereotypical or judgmental or I am uh, projecting, but the people that are riding their bikes on the sidewalk, they don't look like they're out for a happy bike ride um, with their family or running errands. They look like they're coming to and from a long, hard day at work. And they look like people who could least afford a misdemeanor because that's illegal. You are not allowed to ride your bike on the sidewalk. So I don't know if we want to change the law to be able to ride your bike on the sidewalk or make safe streets where it's not a life or death activity to ride your bike to work. Um, <laughs> I don't know if anybody spends a lot of time on Depot Street or has been to New Hampshire Pizza Company recently. They have a back patio, uh, you know, right by Chuck's Barbershop. It overlooks... Uh, the parking lot for anybody that works at uh, Concord Craft Brewery, it overlooks the gorgeous Stores Street parking structure onto the Chamber of Commerce parking lot. And in the distance, you can see I-93. And people still choose to eat there overlooking that. So I can only imagine how popular of a place Depot Street would be if we had a deck park where you could see in the distance people gathering with their families instead of I-93. Um, I also want to mention um, the Greenway Trail. Uh, I, I wrote up a little synopsis, and I know that I might come off as, as very critical of the Greenway Trail and what I'm about to say, but I want to specify that, um, in my opinion and the way that it's been presented to me, the Greenway Trail is a, has been a trade-off. You know, we are going to, you as a city are going to allow us to expand this freeway in uh, return for that, we're going to build you this Greenway Trail. And that just seems like we're getting the short end of the stick. I know they're doing tons and tons and tons, almost half a billion dollars maybe of work in addition to that. But specifically referring to the Greenway Trail, it doesn't seem like a fair trade. Um, so with that being said, <sighs> um, adding lanes to East Congestion is similar to loosening your belt to try to lose weight. It doesn't solve the problem, but it definitely makes you feel good. 
Um, I use the freeway uh, to get around town. I uh, live near uh, Runlet Middle School, so the fastest way for me to get anywhere is go down to exit 12. So I go down to exit 12, I get off at 14 to go to Fort Eddy. Grocery store, Lowe's, anything else. Um, I use it to pick my kids up to daycare. They go to NHTI, so I get on exit two or 12 or 14 if I'm at work to 15 to 393 to exit one. Um, I do that whole rigmarole. Um, I use it to go to the dentist um, on Triangle Drive over by Target. I use it to go to the rec center. Um, I use it to drop off my dog at daycare on exit 17. I use it to go to, you know, Arnie's on Loudon Road because Eastside Drive is the fastest way to get there. I, I use it to go from exit 12 to exit 13 to get to Manchester Street if I'm going to dinner at Moritomo's or, uh, or um, uh, Red Blazer um, or Beef Sides. Um, I take it to get my car, or I used to take it to get my car fixed at uh, South Main Auto. Um, and I would put my bike on the bike rack and I'd drop my car off at South Main and then um, I'd ride back to my office on Main Street and um, I'd wait for Monique to give me a call to let me know <coughs> how much more money it's gonna cost to fix my car, but that was awful. I hated that. So um, I moved uh, closer to an auto garage and now I go to the one that's closest to my house. Um, so I, you know, taking the freeway is the fastest way to get anywhere because it's congested and there's stoplights and pedestrians and anything else. Um, so uh, this project will cement the car as the most efficient way and the fastest way to get around town, especially with the auxiliary lanes between exits, removing any incentive to expand public transit, create walkable or bikeable routes, or set land and funding aside for larger mass transit projects such as rail. Concord is slated to get more, more than 100 <coughs> housing units. In all of those housing units, the people that live there will use the freeway to get from A to B if this project goes through, clogging up those newly expanded lanes that we've created, as well as bypassing any local businesses that they might have taken if they weren't on the freeway in the first place. But I want to give credit where credit is due. Gene, as far as I understand it, was the lead engineer on the Main Street reconstruction project. And Concord's Main Street is the reason my family chose to move here and the reason we stay here when other opportunities present themselves. And the thing about creating a complete street that is enjoyable to spend time in when you're outside of a car is that once you get a taste of it, you want more of it. You want to be able to have that experience in other places. And I've heard the mayor talk about it as well as the Chamber of Commerce speak earlier about making Concord a more beautiful place to be seen from the freeway. And the problem that I see with that is if you're creating and incentivizing people to get off of the freeway to come downtown, you're gonna need places to store those vehicles while those people are experiencing downtown, which creates a bigger need for parking structures and garages and lots. And that's valuable real estate downtown. I would rather see another business that could provide taxpaying dollars be developed in that downtown district. Um, I also want to acknowledge the value that the Merrimack Greenway Trail will be to this project. It is a bright spot if the project goes through, but referring to it as a transportation corridor is putting lipstick on a pig. The trail is and will continue to be used as a recreational trail by those who can afford a bike and that can be afford a bike that can be used on mixed surfaces, as well as those that have the free time to dedicate to putting their bike on their car, driving to the trailhead, and spending an entire day riding the bike. The trail will not help students get to school, the elderly to the pharmacy, or help me get to the grocery store. That's what I have to say. Thank you very much. Yeah. That was great. Thank you. You're asking the city to advocate um, on behalf of the I-93 project, the full 14.2 mile envisioned Merrimack River Greenway Trail from one end in the south end town border all the way to the north end town border. I'm, I'm asking them to do what? The whole, you're asking us to ask for the whole 14.2 mile that is planned for the Merrimack River Greenway Trail. Or, because what you're <laughs> suggesting is yeah. we're focusing on just this one section, which is the first <sighs> section, but it's actually 14.2 miles. Um, I believe that is a very complicated question. Um, 
and can I, I just back up yeah. and just make it easier for you? Definitely. Were you aware there was a longer trail? Oh yes, I, I know okay. it's supposed to go from the Mass border all the way up to Hanover, maybe. Ours is in the Concord area only. Oh, yeah, um, I, I, it is. It is a statewide uh, grand vision, um, but uh, to me, my my uh, uh, bugaboo with you know, especially focusing on that, is that the incentive. If the project goes through as planned, even if we ask for the whole full for 14 miles, it's north to south. Um, I've been on the bike path that goes along Fisherville Road. That's still terrifying. Even though it's new, it's still awful. I would love to be able to ride my bike from Runlet all the way to Beaver Meadow, but I'm not going to do that because it's terrifying. Um, you know, my daughter during the pandemic, when uh, NHTI was closed, went to a, a private daycare that was on State Street. And I had to make a left-hand turn onto, um, I can't remember the name of the street, but it was, you know, off of Fisherville Road. And I you never, I, I never knew if anybody was going to stop, go, or pull out of a driveway going 20 miles an hour and just T-bone me. It, it's not a, a fun, safe place to be, especially outside of a car. Um, so... I, I think focusing on a recreational trail as a transportation corridor is doing a disservice to the term transportation. Um, I think transportation should include all modes, whether that's bike, bus, train, tram, car, limo, whatever it needs to be. But um, you know, having that be the trade-off, I, I, I don't think is a, a uh, fair trade-off. Thank you. Anyone else? Council 9. Are you supportive of the project? Uh, no. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know if um, when City Council will be voting uh, for approval or conditional approval um, for the project as planned, um, but I, I uh, am a member of the Transportation Policy Advisory Committee, um, so anybody that's here has, has heard me talk about this a lot before. Um, but I, I don't believe that adding more lanes will ever ease congestion. Um, in fact, the Colorado Department of Transportation recently um, uh, mothballed all of their plans to expand I-25 through the city of Denver because they realized with the exponential growth that Denver has been having and the lanes that they've been adding, it's not helping. They are now working with regional development communities to expand non automotive modes of transit, whether that's light rail, heavy rail, biking, walking. Their, their goal is to get people out of their cars because like loosening the belt, you know, the, the solution to, to losing weight is to eat right and exercise. It's not to buy a bigger size of clothes. Anyone else? Okay, thank you very much, appreciate it. Yeah. Go to the, I think we're in the back of the room. Who's next? <clears throat> Welcome. Thank you. Good evening. I'm, uh, I'm Paul Suska. I'm with the Bike Walk Alliance of New Hampshire. Um, Bike Walk Alliance, uh, what we do is we educate and advocate to improve conditions for uh, walking and bicycling statewide. Uh, our goal is more people out walking and biking more often. Uh, this contributes to stronger economy, a healthier people, healthier environment, and stronger communities. Uh, we appreciate uh, DOT's willingness to work with the bike ped uh, community as expressed by uh, Mr. Ayad at the August 9th TPAC uh, meeting as, and as demonstrated by uh, many of the features of the current plan for the project. And we also uh, thank DOT for providing for the 14-foot uh, wide multi-use path over the Loudon Road Bridge uh, with, with a, also with another six-foot sidewalk on the other side, as I understand, um, and also for bringing the Merrimack River Greenway Trail through the project area uh, to downtown and uh, to the Northern Rail Trail. Uh, BWANH does not have a preference among the six concepts uh, that were presented 
uh, deferring to other groups, including the Concord Green Space Coalition and Friends of the Merrimack River Greenway Trail uh, in the city, of course. Uh, we also appreciate NHDOT's stated intention to treat stormwater before discharging it to the Merrimack River. And we appreciate uh, your support, Mr. Mayor, and the Council uh, for, uh, towards the goal of improving uh, bike ped uh, conditions and opportunities uh, you know, as a result of the project. Now looking ahead to completing the planning process for the project, uh, BWA NH supports the following. Uh, a feasibility study by a deck park firm for a deck park and accommodation for the deck park in the I-93 expansion plan. A deck park would make Concord more walkable city, uh, and help reverse some of the harm done to the city's relationship with the river that was done by the railroad and by I-93. Uh, we also support the specific recommendations made by the, the, uh, the TPAC with respect to bike ped safety at each of the uh, interchanges and roundabouts, uh, improvements at the Manchester Street, Merrimack River Greenway Trail crossing, uh, beautifying the I-93 bridge over Loudoun Road uh, to avoid creating more of a barrier between the Heights and downtown, and paying particular attention to trail crossings to ensure safety and also access to the trail. We also support minimizing the widening, reducing the footprint of the project to the extent possible, um, reducing the number of lanes from eight to six if possible. We also support improving safety design at all the interchanges for bikes and pedestrians. We, improve, we uh, support improving safety design at all interchanges for bikes and pedestrians. Yes, I meant to say that twice. <laughs> um, and we support providing more accommodation of and safety considerations for bicyclists and pedestrians, especially around the multi-lane exits. And we support providing barrier protected bike lanes on major commuting routes. Um, <clears throat> safety by design is uh, really the only safety that works. And we support providing plans for clearly demonstrating transitions between, uh, that tell drivers they're leaving the highway and entering you know, a slower traffic area. Um, and finally, we support including high-quality streetscaping and landscaping at all the interchanges. Uh, just want to thank you for the opportunity to provide input, and we hope that um, this meaningful dialogue with the public will continue as part of the process. Thank you very much. Any questions? Seeing none, appreciate you, your time and attention. Thank you. Mr. Swigert. If you haven't noticed, is the trend they go from this side to that side to this side to that side. So I'm betting the next person is probably going to be over here. I will try to keep this uncharacteristically short and try and answer your questions. If you had some illness, the doctor told you had an illness and told you the cure was something, and you didn't like the cure, and he came back and said you still need the same cure, and you said no, I don't, and he still came back and said you need the same cure, it would be time to change your doctor. The last one of these public meetings, I said we need to tell the state that they should take this out of the 10-year plan and don't put it back in until we get a new project manager and a new consultant because they're just not listening to us. And there's two particular features of this that I think are critical to the project that they just won't change. So we need a new project manager and a new consultant, and if we don't get them, take it out of the 10-year plan. You say it can't be done. Well, I seem to recall the city removed Langley Parkway from the 10-year plan. It wasn't necessary. You may notice there's no exit 21 on I-93. That was supposed to be the crossing for a limited access highway between Laconia and Franklin. Laconia and Franklin still wanted it, but Tilton didn't. It's never been built and it never will be. They were supposed to build a bypass around uh, Dublin because it was a steep hill with a flagpole right in the middle of the road and the truckers didn't like it. The DOT kept coming up and saying, we need to build a bypass. They said, no, you don't. That's dead. If we can't get the state to build a version of I-93 that is good for the city and not just good for the state, then we need to tell them no. And if you say it can't be done, back when we had the 55 mile an hour speed limit during the energy crisis, a lot of people I knew in Boston didn't go up 93 anymore. They went up Route 16 to the White Mountains because it was shorter. The state could take Route 16, make that a four lane limited access highway, and all of a sudden there'd be a whole bunch of traffic that wasn't going up 93 anymore. So this project is not necessary. And we can kill it if they won't do two things that we want. 
Number one, the Merrimack River Greenway Trail needs to run along the river from exit 13 to exit 14. That is not negotiable. They said, oh, we can't do that. We can't have people walking on the shoulder of 93. Well, I agree, you shouldn't have people walking on the shoulder of 93. But if you look at that area, most of that length is Teardrop Park. That's got huge width. That could be landscape. That could be made into a major park. But there's only a very short section that would require kind of a bench along the road and not up at the road level. The road is 20 feet or more above the river. It could be 10 feet down. There could be a chain link fence so no one walks from the trail up onto the 93. But you could have a perfectly good trail between the river and 93, and that's where it needs to go. And that's not going to be expensive. And it's the sort of thing that has to happen. The second thing that has to happen is we need a pedestrian crossing at exit 15. I mean, right now, everyone's saying we're going to make exit 14 perfect. But what happens during construction? What happens if there's some sort of emergency and I get choked off? Where are those poor pedestrians going to go? All the way down to Manchester Street? All the way up around the tech school in East Concord? No. We need a pedestrian crossing and a bike crossing about where exit 15 is. Obviously, it's not going to be simple. It's going to be twisty like the one they have down at the 93 and 89 interchange now. But that's not negotiable. They can't build us the Merrimack Greenway Trail along the river from 13 to 14 between the interstate and the river. We say, no, we don't want this project. They can't build us a pedestrian connector at exit 15. No, we don't want this project. And if this consultant, this project manager can't do it, well, fine, get different ones. We don't have to put up with this. We've, there's been a lot of highway projects canceled in the state, and there can be one more if they won't do what's important to us. As far as the deck park, I don't see why the city is spending money to hire a consultant to do a deck park. What we should do is connect Teardrop Park to downtown, preferably with a tunnel under 93, so you go directly from downtown to the north end of Teardrop Park, and don't have to go all the way down to Manchester Street and back up. And then you've got ample area for a really good park, not just some maintenance-intensive little thing like a deck park. That's what we need to do. So I think I've answered your question and your question, but if I haven't, go ahead. Thank you very much. Anybody seen that? Appreciate it. Oh, 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 oh. Please don't fall. Nervous all the uh, every time I'm up here, so I just have just, to. Just don't fall. Just don't fall. <sighs> Hello, my name is Meredith Cooley. Thank you all so much for your service. Um, I'm just going to keep this brief because uh, everybody has done a great job <coughs> bringing forth such amazing points. Um, I've said it before, and I'm going to say it again. I-93 divides our city. It divides us in terms of racial and socioeconomic um, class and status. It divides our resources. We have the high school, the library, city hall, downtown, everything is, uh, many things are on the west side. And we have businesses up on the east side that because of the highway interchange, people on the west side aren't necessarily wanting to go under and, and navigate to go spend their money on the east side. And that has an impact on the economic development on the east side. I've said these things, so I'm, <coughs> I'm not going to go there. But I, I, wanna, I just want to say that a deck park and a pedestrian river bridge or an improvement opportunity of similar um, similar capacity serves to bridge the socioeconomic divide exacerbated by the highway by providing connection for all of Conquer's residents, including those who can't afford or otherwise don't have access to a car. This reduces barriers to civic engagement and improves access to public resources. Uh, we had a, we hosted a community meeting. Con I'm with Conquer Green Space um, Coalition. We hosted a a community meeting because we're um, 
we're considering switching directions um, to not just being about protecting green space, uh, but, but to addressing all, um, any um, issue that comes up in Concord that has a deep and lasting impact. And it, as part of that meeting, um, Fisto was there, and we were talking about name changes for our organization, and he suggested one Concord. And everybody just said, oh, whoa, and I've got chills. And I just wanted to bring that up because um, do we want to have one Concord? Because I do, and not two Concords, not East Side and West Side. And I feel like this is our opportunity in whatever shape it takes to connect our city. A deck park and bridge serves as a symbol that our community stands as one and serves as a sense of pride. And um, I also want to um, thank the city councilors who showed up on Sunday to stand up against hate um, uh, when the Proud Boys were here trying to intimidate our neighbors and fellow community members. And I'd just like to say thank you and I hope we can bring those values um, into this project as well. Uh, it's really great to see our city standing up for those important values. Um, I also wanted to mention briefly that um, we had a, a quick meeting with um, uh, uh, Councillor Cindy Warmington um, who w got us up to speed on some of the early um, parts of this project. And um, one of the things that she wanted to us to understand was that this the I-93 from Bow Concord wasn't just Concord, it's Bow, it's, this, it's the um, communities north and that they're really looking, f um, they might be, I, I haven't talked to them myself, um, but could be really looking at this as um, a positive thing, this expansion. Um, and so I thought, um, our thought as a team was, can we have a regional charrette where we all are come together and, and talk to each other, maybe even a statewide charrette because I-93 um, really does impact the whole state, um, to really get an understanding of where everybody is coming from. Because if, if the expansion is a benefit to communities outside of Concord, but it's really having a negative impact on Concord, couldn't there be some leveraging there in terms of costs of what it would take to connect our city and, and make, the, make it benefit our city as opposed to, um, you know, and I'm not sure exactly what that looks like, but if they wanted to help with our deck park project so that there's some, some um, working together as a broader community. Um, and then I just wanted to clear up something that Jean, I think you're a perfectly handsome man. <laughs> Thank you very much. Don't, don't, don't go, don't go. Oh, you're right, sorry. Don't, don't go. By the way, Gene's only 25. I don't know if you knew that. <laughs> <laughs> he did Main Street when he was 15. So, um, so uh, uh, you've spoke, I, I have one serious question, two I want to have just fun with you, but, um, so, so it should be fun. Uh, first question, serious question is that is, um, you saw with this item, item 30, that there's also a report to city council from the uh, manager regarding the I-93 Bow Concord widening bridge park concept, correct? That, I'm sorry, what? So as part of this item, not only is it a public hearing on the proposed project in terms of 93, but there's also a report attached to that. Yes, by um, Matt Walsh. Matt talking Ma the whole thing. They, they blur into one for me, so okay. I don't know. Um, so you saw the report. I did. Does this, does this answer uh, your uh, concerns about doing a feasibility study? No. I, uh, does, tell, me, tell, tell me why. Wait, so uh, that sounded like a leading question. Did, do I think that? Um, so this, this, so let me put my glasses on so I can actually. Okay. Yeah, okay, too. so. Item 30, report to City Council regarding I-93 Bow Concord Widening Project Bridge Park concept. Okay? This is Are the we on, wait, wait, just so I'm clear, because I'm nervous hearings. and it's like That's you're okay. starting That's to get okay. into the no, weeds, no problem, so no problem, I'm, no I problem. just want to make sure I'm. Just want to make sure I got it. It's this so, one, right? So item 20J, or also otherwise known as item 30, 
right? Okay. His report from Matt Walsh, dated November 14th. Yeah. Right? You have brought up the issue of feasibility study to look yes. at a deck park, a bridge, whatever it might be. Yes. Does this memo answer your questions regarding a feasibility study? Well, let me ask you a question about this memo just so I'm... I'm asking sure, a question this I time. I literally <laughs> was walking down here and reading this on, um, on my phone and I don't have very great eyes. eyes. So um, it sounds like in the beginning of this, um, of this report, all the reasons why it's... Um, all the reasons why things were rejected and it's not the same as the Opportunity Corridor in 20, 2006, that there's been, that that's not feasible. And then at the very end, it talks about um, identifying and evaluating those one, two, three, four, five, which is saying this is what we would need to do. Right, so it gives a little history. Yep. Because people have talked about the history in the past and I think, I think that Mr. Walsh cleared up a lot of the questions and where things came from in the comments. But at the end, on page four, as you pointed out, there are five items that uh, call for the evaluation and feasibility study. Does this answer your question about wanting a feasibility study? Can I read it? I'm, can I take sure. a look? You want me to read it so everybody can hear it out loud? That'd be great. So with these considerations in mind, should the city council wish to revisit and further evaluate the concept of a bridge park or other pedestrian bridge concepts through the I-93 corridor, city administration would solicit proposals from the city's on-call engineering consultants for the purpose of engaging one of said firms to, one, identify and evaluate them a more potentially suitable locations for a bridge park other than or other pedestrian bridge over the high-speed rail corridor and 93 generally between exit 13 and 14 to connect downtown to the Merrimack River. Two, yes. develop concept plans for said structures, including profiles, cross-section, sectional views of said structure together with layout plans, <laughs> drawings, and renderings of therewith. Three, develop plans demonstrating how the, the said structures would connect to Store Street, to the Merrimack River, and to Loudon Road if viable. Four, identify private property acquisitions and major infrastructure improvements that would be necessitated to make such structure feasible. Five, develop preliminary cost estimates for each concept. Upon receiving proposals, staff would, would return to the city council to seek the appropriation of funds said studies. Is that what, when you have advocated for feasibility, which I think we both agree was necessary, yeah. does this answer your concerns? Um, yeah, I, well, you and I have been on the same page about. But I just wanna make sure we have this in front of us. This is, this is a document the administration wrote is this acceptable to you is what I'm asking. This looks good to me. Am I getting thumbs up? Yeah. Um, well, I was going to speak to this after. <laughs> Just a clarification on one thing. Do you want me to come up? Nope, nope. nope. I spoke to this. We, we would like you to find, to consult with a specialty firm. Who so so there's, so there's, a, reason, there's a reason why it's written the way it's written. Okay. And I'd be glad, I'd be glad to explain it to you offline, but there's a, there's a, if you want it done quicker, this is the quickest way to do it, and then they would be able to partner with a specialty firm. If you wanted to go to just a specialty firm, then you're adding at least another three to four months of the process. And I didn't think we want to wait. I think we want to move. So that's the reason for not putting a specialty as opposed to on call. They would partner with somebody. Does that make sense? When you suggested having the uh, feasibility stu study done, you specifically said a, um, a firm that specializes. Yes. What led to the change? It's just the timing Time. to the change? Mm -hmm. I, I'd rather not wait the three or four months. I'd rather get yeah. that sooner. Okay, you yeah. can think I about it. I feel like I'm put on the spot and I'm not really like an expert at this. So um, right, my if, two if other any of the other council members who have been in this longer. I'm sure somebody will come up and talk about it. All right, my two fun questions are this. You talked a lot a bit about the socioeconomic um, uh, divide in the city and such. So, um, I noticed that um, uh, you have uh, have had opinions about um, the Runlin Middle School. And mm -hmm. so, what I take away from your comments that you would be advocating for building a new Runlin Middle School on the east side of the river? We have, and I'm so glad you brought this up because we are having a community charrette on Wednesday to 
go out to, uh, up at the citywide community center to have um, folks from all over the community come and talk about what lo design, it's a mi middle school location design um, charrette. Awesome, thank and you. So, um, we are, so we are holding space to see what the community wants. I'm not gonna tell, tell the community now, you know, I'm not gonna tell the community what the best thing is. I wanna, we are hoping to hear from everyone, if as many people as can come out. Um, but you'll notice on our website that because one of our core values is equity, that we are, we had changed course from um, Rebuilding at Runlet is still a, a great possibility, but if there is a possibility to build on the east side so that we're serving underserved um, communities in that by offering more resources on the east side, then we are going to advocate, um, then we support that. It's, and it's, as we've learned, because we're all learning, um, decisions are, it, it's not just as, a clear decision. It's you know, balance of, of everything, cost and all these kinds of things. But yes, we would like to see more resources. We also advocate, I know there's the a YMCA was um, supposed, was proposed to go at the center point location. Um, why not be on the east side? Why not have that wonderful resources resource on the east side so we can get some more flow of um, traffic. So. Um, we'd like to, I, but I, I we'd, 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 we'd a, prefer having, having infill development-wise, like density, and we'd love for that Steeplegate Mall to... Just, just want to, I appreciate your, <laughs> uh, I appreciate your opportunity to give people a chance to go and facilitate the conversation. Yes, That's please. important. The second question, though, and, and this is pretty actually serious, too. Would you advocate for um, combining the Merrimack Valley School District and the Concord School District? Because you talked about the two mm. Concords. So you, people will think east and west. How about north and south? <coughs> Do you actually, what do you think about combining the, uh... Oh, you're asking such great questions, thank you. Um, and we've I'm spoke... watching Consulate Todd over there start to spin um, a little bit. Uh, but... I, well, <laughs> I think... <laughs> one thing that um, our group really likes to do is, is do some research and really um, understand, <coughs> at least we've learned, that we really need to understand the history and what goes into all those things. So I would love to talk to all the counselors about what um, and people who have experience there, but knee-jerk reaction, I am. I think it's a great idea. I um, cool. so right. yeah. I would I, personally, I would be in support of it from the very little I know of that possibility. Um, as a group, we would have to do a lot of research and do a lot of networking about what the community wants and what Mary Mac. You know, it's sounds good. Uh, Thank you. I'm all for your name change. Anybody else have any questions? Thank you. That was fancy. Thank you. Thank you for coming out. Good to see you again. Good to see you too. Um, so I just want to run through a couple of things because I know your group has been working really hard and looking at all the things. And most of the comments I've seen, are, I think, are really focused on exit 14. So um, I'm just wondering, so exit 12, is your group generally OK with what's being proposed? Ooh, I'm so glad you asked that. Um, I think um, there are some. We see some really positive things that some of the that the DOT plan has proposed in terms of making some of the interchanges um, better performing. Um, I don't even know if that's the right word. Engineers, correct me. Um, doing the red list bridges, we were really thankful to DOT for for um, really taking in those issues and addressing them. Um, I think there's probably someone behind me who's going to speak and has a lot. Better things to say, but I think there. Um, but I think the walkability and the bikeability and the safety um, issues is. I think you've heard it from us time and time again around making that more safe is um, is a priority. Okay. Um, how about exit thirteen? Similar. I again. I'm I'm going to leave it to my engineering experts, okay. um, but. I think our stance is pretty clear that safety for pedestrians and bikes um, is, uh, I think I already said it. Okay. And I know 14, obviously there's a lot of different things um, that, that people are interested in. Um, how about exit 15? 
Is your group generally good with what's being proposed by DOT at this point? Uh, X of 15 is a tricky one because of 393. Yeah. And um, I, I mean, from how I look at it, the auxiliary lanes that are going to go across, from that, that is to me needs to be reduced to six lanes. Um, I'm with the mayor at having people slow down and get off in Concord. Um, and again, I'm going to pass those off to my, my more knowledgeable friends. Okay. That was great. Of you. Thank you. As a resident, you've driven the corridor through all the interchange. What do you think is the most dangerous on the highway? Um, I am going to say that I have personally, when, uh, so I'm, I'm not good at, when I get off and try to get, um, exit 15, I believe, when I'm trying to get back on the highway heading southbound, um, it's, um, quick. It's quick. Thank you. Yeah. That's all. Um, anybody else? Thank you very much. Really appreciate you coming tonight. Thank you. Back there. Welcome. Hi. Hi. Um, thank you for all your service on the council. My name is Carrie Allen. I live in Concord for almost 14 years, the first seven in East Concord and the last seven in West Concord. Um, I drive up north every day to Sanberton where I teach and during the school year and in the summer frequently to Bristol where I grew up to visit my parents. So I'm there a lot. <laughs> I spend a lot of time on 93. Um, I'm just here to advocate and support what has been said before me. I'm for connecting Concord in a responsible, equitable, and creative way one that we'll be proud of and one that will make the expansion something that will add accessibility for residents, aesthetically pleasing for visitors, and truly connect both sides of our city for all residents. I'd like to see less widening than proposed. Um, I'd love to see some sort of bridge, debt park, something, um, and to truly consider safety for pedestrians and bikers on all the exits, on and off. I mean, you're not biking on 93, but you understand what I'm saying <laughs> underneath. Um, I have the privilege of being able to safely walk downtown to Main Street um, for the farmer's market, for dinner. I recognize that's a, that's a privilege um, for so many reasons. Um, and I would like all residents of Concord to have that same privilege um, and would like to see an I-93 project that provides that. That's it. Anybody any questions? Appreciate you coming out tonight. Yeah, thank you. Welcome. Hello. Thank you for your patience. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Um, I'm Allison Raponi of Ward 7. Thank you all for all that you do. And um, thank you for the chance for uh, me being able to share my thoughts. I Rather than repeat points I've shared in emails and um, at a previous meeting, I'll just say that many of the beautiful, very beautiful visuals people have created for a safe, walkable, bikeable, river forward, connected community from the fellow residents that have shared today this is the stuff that I think dreams are made of. And I think, I'd argue, that these are dreams that can come true and we should just try to fulfill it. Um, that's my stance on that. And, but because I'm a project manager by trade, I'm gonna go from conceptual to logistics and um, specifically about the idea of east-west connection, river access, walkability, bikeability, bridge park. Um, I don't have an engineering background. And so what I'm falling back on is um, in, in order to understand the feasibility, I don't understand things from a technical standpoint. So I think there are two elements that I really am hoping to see. One is having these charrette, a charrette or charrettes that encourage participation from residents of all wards, varied backgrounds and varied transportation needs. And I do support these charrettes inviting other New Hampshire towns along 93, so this reg regional concept that Meredith had spoken to. Um, and the second thing is the 
memo by Matthew Walsh, the only thing that, and you spoke to it, um, Mayor, about wanting to facilitate a faster um, review and study, which I support, but I would hope that in the memo it's included that they would actually partner with somebody who has a portfolio that have already done deck parks in the past. Thank you. Any questions? Thanks. So, no, appreciate that. Thank you very much. Rainer. I'll send this one so I don't fall back. <laughs> <laughs> Just uh, thank you very much for uh, putting your um, your testimony in writing and sending it to us. Oh, that was distributed that was to everybody. Distributed. Okay. Everybody has well, thank you. Thank you. So, um, Ron Rainers and I am resident in Concord since 89, um, retired engineer. So I have previously submitted comments uh, through TBAC uh, back in mid-13, September 13th. And, and those comments really still, I maintain, are still relevant today for exits 12 through 15. I also went on a bit about the MRGT because I think there's a phenomenal potential to bring more people to the area through through the Greenway Trail. And, um, and even though it's, it's because it's conceptual, I also looked extensively at the video from the August 9th public hearing and kind of came up with a hybrid myself. And because I feel strongly that about the additional usage that that trail will bring, I feel strongly that we shouldn't have an at grade pedestrian crossing at the intersection of uh, Loudon Road and Fort Eddy Road. So I came up with a hybrid that was very circuitous, which I admit went through private property, and I was trying to utilize existing at grade crossings on Fort Eddy Road, i.e. being the one at L.L. Uh, Bean and <coughs> Staples right there. Um, but it, admittedly, again, it was round, it was long ways around, went through private property, so I came up with something else over the weekend, and that's what I put in the form of a memo um, and distributed to, to you folks through, through the city clerk, so thank you. Um, and I also, I support the overall concept uh, of the I-93 widening, certainly to six. Conceptually, eight needs to be further evaluated, but I certainly support six lanes. It's no doubt that it's needed. This is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. We need to move forward with it. Um, I support greater connectivity between the west and east side. And, and with my background really being wastewater, uh, rivers, cleaning up rivers, uh, rivers can be a natural resource. There's no doubt it's phenomenal. And to that end, um, the MRGT can just further support this. And although in the past I've been somewhat ambivalent about a deck park, um, you know, perhaps it can be worked in through the MRGT. I do support the feasibility analysis. Absolutely needs to be done. City needs to hire someone to consider both uh, the, the various design parameters and concepts for a deck park as well as incorporating the MRGT into it. And in doing so, I hope they consider what I suggested this morning in a memorandum is that at least that for the portion that goes over Fort Eddy Road, if it's gonna be right at that intersection, that it be an elevated, elevated section over I do, it's gonna be tight, but I do believe there could be space there to do it with that grassy knolled area next to UNO's and even though exit 14 on ramp is going to be moved somewhat east, there could be still room. <clears throat> if you curl it around, it doesn't have to be straight. Um, I'd be happy to meet with folks, Gene, uh, city engineer, whatever. Um, so, uh, and, uh, you know, and because of that, I think. Uh, that, that we need to move forward with the feasibility analysis and, and try to do this as expeditiously as we can. That's really it. I, I think the, uh, what the designers have done with the exits, uh, with the, um, uh, the clover stack, I think is, uh, is good. I think it's gonna alleviate a lot of problems. Um, and you know, I think we just need some, we're down to final tweaking is how I'd like to look at it. 
Thank you very much. Do you have any more questions? Thank you for your. Okay. Thank, thank you. you for the guided tour you gave me around the city. I well. appreciate that. <laughs> Hi. Just to let everybody at home know, we did not get a ticket. We didn't get stopped. We, That's right. We did a great job driving. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Yeah. Welcome. Uh, I'm Nicole Fox. I've lived in Concord for the last 14 years, and I am a transportation engineer. Uh, I appreciate the time and effort that the state has put into this project over the years. However, I believe widening I-93 through Concord will not provide the congestion relief in the long term that they, that they desire. I've lived in Florida and Virginia and seen that no matter what highway widening is constructed, congestion returns very quickly. People change their driving habits and traffic is generated from low density development demands and they use up all the extra capacity that was built. I believe uh, the engineers previously stated this project has been in the works for 20 years. It's reasonable to assume that the state initiated this project because they believe traffic would become significantly worse over time. Given that we currently have less congestion than most places experience before the investment is made to widen them, uh, Usually that would require extended rush hours every day, which we do not have. I have to assume that the original projections of traffic have not come to pass over the last 20 years, which is the lifespan of a road project. Traffic through Congress has been relatively stable over time and has not choked off the flow of tourists, the lakes, and the mountains. I'm not going to claim that there is no inconvenience, but the flip side of that Friday and Sunday inconvenience is an interstate with as small a footprint as possible extending through the heart of our city. The proposed plans call for six through lanes, widened shoulders, and extra auxiliary lanes between the exits. I think that if I-93 didn't exist and NHDOT was proposing to build a new highway in its current location, cutting off downtown from the river and cutting the city in half, everyone would agree that was a terrible idea. But I-93 does exist, and so does this widening project. I would ask the city question the need for so much additional highway widening the state has said they are going to reevaluate their traffic models. As part of that, uh, they're going to be able to reconsider what they deem an acceptable level of traffic congestion and whether perhaps they can live without the auxiliary lanes or possibly keep the current four through lanes and only add the auxiliary lanes. I would also ask that the city ensure the project allows for safe travel through the interchanges for people on foot and bikes, not just in cars, um, as Fisto so um, well explained. It's it's really a matter of equity. Uh, these are important modes of transportation and our city needs to be for everyone. There are details related to bicycle and pedestrian safety that do not seem to have been addressed yet at exits 12, 13, and 14. There is no clear way for bicycles to safely navigate the two roundabouts at exit 12 and the dual right turn lanes at exit 13. Pedestrians will need to cross um, uncontrolled ramps at exits 12 and 14 where traffic is at free flow. Uh, and I would also like to ask that the city hire a specialty planning firm to investigate the feasibility of a deck park. The state has already agreed to ensure the design does not preclude the structure, and this is a once-in-a-generation opportunity um, to reconnect Concord residents with the river and each other, and it's important that the evaluation of this be done by experts in this work. I do have a question, if I'm allowed to ask that, um, as it relates to um, the, whether you uh, go through an on-call contract or not. Um, if you use an on-call engineer, how would the specialty firm be selected? If you were to do a standalone contract, it would, I assume, would be qualifications-based. But how would those qualifications be evaluated through an on-call? Sure. So the, the idea would be use one of our on-call design firms to actually go out and solicit specialty um, contract or our designers nationwide bring back ones that they think would be viable. City would review to see if they have the, the, the experience, the ability uh, to do something like that. And then we have the city council decide which firm to select. Okay. What we've, what we've found is, and I think if I just go on for one second, what we've found is that anytime you're dealing with a, um, uh, a national firm of some sort, whether we're doing a Main Street project or the community center, 
they always come and partner with a local, meaning statewide company, because they want to get that experience. They want, to, so what we're thinking is the best idea, so, somebody who, who has experience working with the New Hampshire Department of Transportation, mm -hmm. coupled with a specialty national firm, would actually bring us the best results. You get, because if you don't do it that way, it's going to happen that way anyway. It's just going to take a lot longer if you just go, if we do an RFQ, put the information out, get that back, back in, they're going to come and contact the local firm, which we may not be comfortable with. Sure. And then all of a sudden, they're going, we're going to dismiss that, that national firm. That's the idea. Okay. And again, it, it should cut down several months out of the, out of the process. Yeah, as long as the city itself is able to select that firm based on qualifications, then... We're going to want to make sure someone actually has experience in doing something very similar to what we're looking for. So if, a, if one of our uh, on-call on firms brings a company that doesn't have that experience, we're not really interested. Okay, great. You're welcome. Thank you. A gazillion years ago, I was on uh, one of the original TPAC committees, Transportation Policy Advisory here in the city. And uh, one of the things I learned was about um, William Vickery. Are you familiar with him, Nobel Laureate in Economics and his bathtub theory on traffic? I am not. Ah, so essentially it's that the traffic bottles up and eventually it builds up until it spills over. And my understanding is that's what we're experiencing now uh, Mr. Espel talked about this a little bit last month, about the, the spillover that we're seeing in other areas of the city, especially when we see higher traffic volumes, mm -hmm. um, so that on the weekends, when we see people driving down Fisherville Road and clogging up Fisherville Road so that people cannot make a left-hand turn into the businesses, et cetera, Sewell Falls Road and Mountain Road, um, and we're seeing people cut through the city, and we're seeing people actually following Route 3 through downtown in their big, long, um, Boats following behind them to get through hooks it. These are all good things. Yes? <coughs> no, those are not good things. Uh, I just don't think that this project is going to solve that problem. I think the fact that there are so few north south routes um, and they're not very well interconnected, uh, you're going to continue to have this problem. It's and frankly, I think if you widen the highway, you're going to see increased development pressure in the north of Concord and exit 17 and 16. And I think you're going to end up with worse congestion. Thanks. I appreciate mm -hmm. it. You can look him up. He's fascinating. All right. Uh, gotcha. Rice Hawkins and Kelsey Keach. Thank you. Um, would you believe that, <laughs> <laughs> that I appreciated very much the time you spent with me driving the roads of my district? We went all the way up uh, 14, 15, 16, 17. We went down East Side Drive. We went up Mountain Road. We went over into Pinnacook. Um, looking at some of that Sunday traffic that I know has affected my district and talking about solutions, it was really helpful to hear your perspective and your expertise and to incorporate some of the concerns community members had brought up. And also in talking to a lot of members of my district, um, hearing from them that they echoed many of the same concerns that you have brought up about what will actually impact the traffic flow what they'd like to see and some of the other solutions. So appreciate that time and would you believe I found it very hopeful that you participated in that and you'd spend the time on a busy Sunday afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, did I hear early on in your testimony that your belief was traffic counts have not increased in the last 10 or 20 years? Was that, um, did I it, hear that right? It was that they've been relatively stable. And where did that information come from? Uh, that came from my experience commuting to and from Manchester. So your personal experience, not any empirical uh, well, data I from, have from looked an engineer? Or, can I finish the question? Mm -hmm. So not empirical data from an engineer or some, someone like that? Well, I have looked at the traffic counts on the state's website, and traffic has increased. Um, but it, as so a, it has but it, increased? It has increased, but uh, over well, as a percentage. But your was it hasn't increased. I said it's been relatively stable. Okay, yep. It you. has increased. It has not been a dramatic increase over those years. Thank you again. Who else would like to ask me? You guys can pick which one you want.
Hello, uh, my name is Aaron Frackman Rowe. Live in Ward Five. I've lived in Concord for uh, over 20 years now, I think. Um, I'd just like to echo what a uh, number of other people have said before me. Um, uh, our bike and pedestrian lanes are vitally important. We need to make sure that they are engineered well, um, engineered for short direct access. There's a concept of desire paths, a few hundred feet for walkers or a few hundred yards for bikers, uh, for users who are not in it for the exercise. Uh, those users end up taking the straight path, even though that may be on a road for five, six lanes for vehicles. So we need to take, make sure that those get taken into account. Um, understand that the red less bridges and the safety for motorists is a key concern of this project. Um, a lot of difficulty merging through the highway. Uh, I have to say my most concerning place to merge usually is uh, between exit 15 and 14 southbound. <laughs> um, and that is due to these short distance between exits, short on ramps and whatnot. I know the project uh, realigned some of those on ramps and off ramps, um, which may help. Um, I'd just like to see that if there is another lane that is required, and I'm not sure that there is, um, let's make that about safety versus high speed, maybe extending the slip lanes instead of adding a new high speed left lane. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody have any questions? Appreciate your testimony. Thanks. Good evening, welcome, and great job when you leaves. Well, <laughs> careful, careful your chair. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is Jeff Evans, and I have a long version, which I'm going to leave with you, but not read all of, because of the app. Um, and a lot of the things that I, I am interested in expressing have been said. Um, but I, I am largely concerned with the scale of the project. As I've said at a previous meeting, I don't see what this does for the city of Concord. I think this is going to be great for the residents of Newton uh, who are traveling to Loon. And uh, it's going to have a big impact on, uh, on our local community. Um, the idea that, that widening the highway successfully reduces congestion has been found to be flawed. Uh, there's a concept called induced demand that says wider highways create more traffic, not less, because more people use the highway and the land will be developed near the highway until the congestion level equalizes to what it was before the widening, or it will become worse. Uh, there's a 26-lane highway in Houston, Texas, and, I, and uh, it, is, uh, it is congested even after that widening. I don't know that four, la four more lanes there is going to fix their problem, um, but I'm sure that at some point some very smart and well-intentioned uh, well engineers argued that it probably would. Um, I asked the engineers after the last presentation in November, uh, who are in the back here, what speed they were designing the widened highway to accommodate. What is the design speed of, the, of this uh, four lane, uh, sorry, eight lane wide highway? And they told me that it is designed to accommodate traffic of 60 to 65 miles per hour. Um, but they assured me that they are not planning to change the speed limit. Um, so the speed limit on I-93 is currently 55. Um, so if improving safety is one of the goals, why are they planning to design it so that drivers will feel safe driving 10 miles per hour over the speed limit? Uh, higher speeds mean that curves have to be larger, more trees need to be cleared next to the highway. Setting the speed the highway is designed for at um, higher than the speed limit just encourages speeding. I, I think this returns to the question of scale, of the design of the project. Um, I would love to see the city ask the DOT to evaluate uh, more options that try to balance the width of the highway, with community needs, uh, and consider accepting less than perfect conditions for through traffic to balance the impacts on the residents of Concord. Um, I do support 
the request for uh, a feasibility study for access to the river that you all are planning to submit. I think that's great. I look forward to hearing what, uh, what proposals come back. There, I do have some comments here on exit by exit uh, concerns. I'm going to let you all read those on your own time so that people can get on with their, their evening. <coughs> who to give this to? You just pass it to Councilor Todd. The left. So um, just so you know, um, the clerk will send that out by email to everybody. So tomorrow we'll have a copy of that. Great. So uh, thank you all. Maybe have any questions? Thanks. Appreciate it. Welcome. I'm nervous about falling now. <laughs> Pull it in. <laughs> My name is Anna Krasinski. Um, it's late, so I will keep it very brief. Um, it seems since the 1993 Merrimack River charrette that uh, this community has some pretty consistent priorities, and those include wanting community spaces along the river, wanting to prioritize safe uh, bike and pedestrian travel, and wanting to connect our city. Um, I, one of the really important things to me tonight was to hear you say that um, the report that came out today isn't meant to preclude having a specialty planning firm. Um, I think that that's incredibly important because as I sit here now, I wish we could go back in time and not have 93 where it is, right? We can't do that. When I'm sitting here 30 years from now, what I want to be saying is how proud I am that we fought for a bold vision, that we moved forward with it, and that uh, we were able to put this bold vision um, you know, into action and create some type of amazing community space and make it so that as my kids age in this city, that they are able to get all over the city safely by walking and biking. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody? Appreciate it. Thank you again. Welcome, welcome. Hi, I'm Susan Woods, um, Ward 5. I will try to keep it very brief as well. Um, but I would argue that I-93 through Concord is so unique in our state. We don't have another city that has a highway bifur bifurcating the city. And so it really takes some creativity on the Depart New Hampshire Department of Transit's part to come up with a really unique situation and really balance the need for increased throughput and safety without destroying uh, the value, the incredible uniqueness of Concord. Um, I'm also concerned about that there's not sufficient um, resources dedicated to cyclists and pedestrian infrastructure I don't know how many of you have followed what's happened at 93 at the inter, uh, the 4A intersection, but the New Hampshire Department of Transit had promised a tunnel to connect the rail trail system. It's the same one we're talking about here that will go from Salem up to um, Lebanon or Hanover, somewhere up in there. And at the last minute, they have changed and reneged on the promise of a tunnel to save $750,000. This is a $112 million project for 0.1%. A tunnel project has been so thrown out and been replaced with some squiggly, crazy, comp crazy thing. What's to keep this from happening here? We're all excited about the Greenway. We're all excited about the Granite Rail tr System. But I'm not sure that it's a priority of New Hampshire Department of Transit. We know this project will come in over budget. So where are they going to cut? Are they going to cut the rail trail and the things that are important <coughs> for us as communities? Um, and uh, I'm not saying that they're bad folks. They're doing their job. Their priority is moving vehicles. And it's really our job as a community to ensure that the pedestrians and cyclists and people that need to be able to access these streets don't get thrown under the bus. So I, I would really request that the city council come up um, f uh, focus on four things. One is to try to b ask New Hampshire Department of Transit to be super creative in coming up with something that does increase the throughput, eases some of the traffic, so hopefully some people will not be cutting off and in, in going through these neighborhoods, but to do it in a way that we don't have to go from a, a highway that is in its narrowest is 78 feet 
in the new one, the what it will be up to 146 feet. That's a lot of asphalt to address this problem. I uh, ask you to approve the funds for the deck part and require that New Hampshire Department of Transit incorporate the potential of this deck part into these plans. Because if we wait until we get all the funding for the deck park or whatever, the pedestrian bridge, if they haven't laid the groundwork for that in these plans, it's going to be too expensive. And you really need to ex get that plan. And I'm glad you're looking at ways to accelerate it. But it needs to be incorporated. If there's some footings or something in there that needs to be done now, now's the time to do it. And we'll figure out how to fund the deck park later. Um, I also would request um, that you consider asking Department of Transit to be sure there's a gr greater percentage of the total project cost allocated to some of these things that are so important, because I'm afraid those are the things that will end up on the cutting room floor when the budgets are all resolved. And um, please hold their feet to the fire that these non-vehicle considerations will, will be given the priority they deserve, because that's what's going to make this really work for Conquer. Thank you. Appreciate your testimony. Anybody? Seeing that? Thank you again. Okay. Anyone else? You sure? Okay. I don't really want to say anything. I just want to see if there's any water in there. <laughs> yeah, I've got, a cup, I've got a cup for you. Let's turn it off the water spigots all over City Hall. You, you might have put it in some paper cup dispensers. <laughs> really, my throat is parched, so excuse me for just a moment. <laughs> I got all night. bring you like your water bottle with you. <laughs> uh, my name is Dick Lemieux. Um, I have uh, something like 53 years of uh, experience in the transportation world. I worked for Federal Highways uh, in, uh, long enough that I was involved at the very beginning of this project. It's, I think it's safe to say that I've been involved in this project longer than anybody in this room, even Gene. Um, so in, uh, before, I retired in 2006 and I was involved in a uh, scoping committee in, in the early, uh, two, two or three years before that. <coughs> Excuse me. So uh, I have the tendency to look at this in a different perspective than a lot of people you heard from. Uh, regarding congestion, um, if, you think, if you think widening a highway doesn't solve congestion, you should drive between Manchester and Salem any afternoon, especially Friday and, and on Sundays, and you'll see that the, the congestion here has been eliminated. Widening highways does eliminate, it does reduce congestion. Not completely, not all the time. You wouldn't be happy if it, if it did because the, the uh, highways would have to be too wide. Um, essentially, uh, the, the way highways, are, uh, the way capacity is increased in highways, it's planned to, to, to reach capacity again and to, uh, to uh, have congestion problems and then you widen it again. And the only alternative is to not widen the highways and put up with congestion. And if you like congestion, think about the uh, um, think about the effects that it has on um, on uh, carbon carbon monoxide. A car traveling at five miles an hour produces 3.4 times as much carbon monoxide as a car traveling at 50 to 70 miles an hour. So all those cars that slow down coming into Concord on Friday afternoons and on Sunday afternoons, those are all producing. 3.4 times, almost three and a half times as much carbon as they would if they were going through at, at prevailing uh, highway speeds, uh, speed limit. So I, I 93 will relieve congestion. It won't reduce traffic. That's not what it's about. You don't want to reduce traffic. You want to reduce congestion. If you reduce traffic, you're, you're, you're reducing environmental, uh, economic viability. Uh, you're stopping people from getting to the North Country to, to, uh, to spend their money. You're stopping people from coming to Concord to spend their money. You're stopping Concord people from going south and north. So congestion is not good for anybody. You have to think about the consequences of these, of these decisions. Uh, <clears throat> I think the, uh, the, the state, the DOT, has already made compromises to us uh, in, in what we've asked for. Uh, at the beginning, we were holding up for, for example, we were holding up for um, putting Interstate 93 lower than, than Loudoun Road. 
I've given up on that. I thought that was important because that was a that was necessary to move the move the rail uh, further to the east, which would have opened up all that land for development in the Opportunity Corridor. We lost that battle. Let's let's get over it. Let's move on. I think right now what we're trying to do is get the most we can out of this project uh, because it's coming anyway. Uh, I was thinking as, as somebody was talking <coughs> about about 30 years ago, this, the DOT did a study as to uh, a study for uh, about widening Route 4 from Concord to the seacoast, and the towns the towns just came unclued. They didn't want they didn't want the interstate going through their towns. So the consequence today is heavy traffic on on Route 4, delays and and stop and go uh, regularly. I'd like to say that nobody wants nobody wants bikeability and walkability more than me. I've been working to bring to bring the Greenway Trail to Concord for for 11 years. Uh, I've been involved in in transportation in Concord since I've lived here, which is over 30 years. Uh, as far as biking on Fisherville Road, I bike on Fisherville Road all the time. Whoever said that, I, I think I know who said that, but. Uh, uh, Fisherville Road was once uh, very dangerous. There was there were no shoulders on Fisherville Road, and what shoulders there were were gravel, and they were hard to ride on. Now it's a panacea. Uh, sooner or later, the, the highway has to be widened. Uh, I challenge you to not overlook the consequences of whatever decisions you you make or you ask the state to make. Uh, if you ask if you ask for the uh, for the road for interstate interstate not to be widened or to be widened only to six lanes. You're going to have to put up the conse uh, consequences. Will be congestion. It will be bypass traffic through Concord streets, <coughs> maybe earlier, earlier than otherwise. Uh, as far as uh, the Greenway Trail being used as a commuter route, I sort of take offense at that because uh, when the when the Greenway Trail is completed, it will be a good commuter route. It will take people from Concord to Penacook and back, and from the south end of, of Concord uh, to Concord downtown. Uh, I once commuted, when I lived in Sacramento, California, I commuted to work by bicycle on the American River bike path. Uh, it was about 10 and a half miles each way, and I got in my exercise, and I often beat my neighbors who would take the bus to work. Um, I used to play, race the bus. And uh, the Minutemen uh, commuter route, or bike route in Massachusetts is also a heavy, heavily used for commuters, by commuters, and uh, it's to the point where, where it has less traffic on it on weekends than it does during the week. And uh, I would uh, support the recommendation that someone made about applying for a bill grant. I think there's a lot of disc discretionary money that's available uh, from the federal government and it's spent on big projects, big um, projects that have, have major goals. And I think this is, a, this is a project where we could get the interstate widened, we could get uh, um, the Greenway Trail built and a lot of other uh, benefits. I think I think we should be investigating that. That's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Council Brown. So you have been the president of the Merrimack River Greenway Trail for 11 years? Well, 10 years. 10 years. Uh, I started working on it before we formed the group. So the boardwalk that would connect Terrell Park to the cornfields, that will actually, as Councilor, Councilor Kredovic pointed out, uh, help those residents who live up on Manchester Street access the grocery stores, is that correct? That's correct. And you've been fundraising for the Greenway Trail for that section for how many years? Well, we've been, we've been fundraising for 10 years for all sections. So, you know, we, uh, we, we invest our money where, where it makes sense, where, the, uh, where we, we, like, we like to leverage our, our money by matching federal grants. So we have, uh, we match the federal grant in Terrell Park. We are committed to matching a federal grant in the cornfield section uh, the, uh, south of the post office. And uh, next year we'll be raising money to match a, a transportation alternatives program grant to build the first section of the rail trail from uh, Boston through uh, Penacook down to Sewell's Falls Road. So yeah, we've been busy. So how uh, long will it take before we'll get this boardwalk that would then connect Manchester Street, Terrell Park to the cornfields. How about how much does that cost? Uh, well, the original estimate for, for building that in 2010 was, was 1.1 million. Uh, but the most recent estimate is, uh, I think it's over 3 million. 
And uh, when will it be built? It'll be built as soon as someone throws $3 million at our feet. And once that's built, that then creates a loop, doesn't it? Connecting Main Street along with the river be over Manchester Street bridges and the Memorial Bridge, which is Loudoun Road Bridge. It would create a loop that's co that consists partly of off-road trail and partly of on-road sidewalks and, uh, and shoulders. But yeah, it wouldn't, it wouldn't complete the, um, the loop on the west side of the bridge. Okay. West side of the river, excuse me. But we would see, it wouldn't be a dead end. You know, people walking on the cornfield could then access Terrell Park and continue oh, on yeah, around. Absolutely. The, cor the, 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 the boardwalk would connect Loudoun Road and Manchester Street. Thank you. Which would connect you to the main transportation system. Mind if I take some more water before I <laughs> Dick, there's a full bar up at the mayor's office. <laughs> That's right, I remember that. <laughs> Thank you all for the work you do. Thank you, Dick. Thank you. Anyone else? You sure? You don't have to, but if you want to. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. With that, we'll close the public hearing. And that completes the public hearings, and we are going to take an extremely necessary two-minute break. <laughs> so we are in recess.
I woke up at 4 a.m. and... I woke up at 3.30, but I went back to bed. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we ready? Yes. Yeah. Anybody remember, know where Council Rice Hawkins? They're in the hallway. In the hallway. Slow Brown. They're in the hallway. Okay. Want me to go? No, you no. sit. Hmm? Can you go? Yeah. Let's Sergeant Arms get him. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Okay, it takes us to our uh, public uh, hearing action phase. Madam Clerk, item 21, please. It's an ordinance amending the Code of Ordinances, Title II, Traffic Code, Chapter 18, Parking, Article 18-1, Stopping, Standing, and Parking, Parking Prohibited at All Times in Designated Places, 1st Bruce Street. Move approval. Second. Motion made, second approve the second. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, ready for vote. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Yes, yeah, seven. Motion is adopted. Madam Clerk, item 22, please. It's an ordinance amending the Code of Ordinances, Title I, General Code, Chapter I, Government Organization, fees, fines, and penalties, together with non-ordinance fees. Move approval. Second. Second. Motion made. Second to approve this item. Is there any discussion? Yes. That's Brown. Um, I just noticed that the fee um, was <coughs> eight cents back in 2016, and it was increased to 10 cents uh, due to inflationary increase, and I'm talking about the um, overall space, the floor space. What page are you on? This is on, I'm looking at, sorry about that, on the first page, well, it's the only page, fee per square foot of gross floor area calculated is the very bottom line. And the change was removing that 10 cent cost. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, I, if anyone from the committee wants to talk about that, but I thought rather than eliminate the fee completely, maybe bring it back to its original rate from 2016. May I respond? Your Honor, please. Thanks. Uh, th thank you for pointing that out, Councilor Brown. Uh, when the committee, when the ad hoc fee committee looked at uh, these development fees, uh, we felt that it was uh, uh, it was wise in order to encourage development, encourage, for example, uh, more housing, uh, which we desperately need, uh, more business development to expand the the, uh, the tax base. That this was a, a prudent change. Uh, it sent would send a signal. Uh, to uh, the development community that we were open for business, uh, that we were uh, responsive to them, and also made it easier, a little bit uh, less cumbersome uh, for them uh, on projects. So it was a, a very well-considered uh, uh, recommended change. May I ask, where do the funds go that are collected for this? General fund. So the, they go to the general fund. General fund. And approximately how much... So for like a 2,000 square foot building, we're talking about maybe $300 or less? Uh, no. It's 10. Brian could do the math. I could do the math, yeah. <laughs> the math oh, I forgot my calculator. Give it to Brian. Um, I, I, th I think the other piece that Councillor uh, Champlin was also trying to explain is that there was the double fee issue that uh, the committee was working with. And the, the issue is that the, the fee was uh, partly based on the value of the project, and then the other portion of the fee was the square footage of the project. So the developers and the builders were getting hit in two different ways. So that encouragement to try to, to, try to eliminate that double fee issue and eliminate that confusion and eliminate that double cost to the developer was the other part of the reason that that uh, decrease was implemented. You're right, the 10 cents per square foot, you know, that's a couple hundred bucks. You know, when you start looking at, you know, bigger square foot projects and then you know, start adding in all the square footage for all the projects across the, across the city, you know, did it amount to, you know, an uh, um, astronomical amount of money? No, it did not. But did it help to simplify the structure for builders and developers as they're working through the process in the city and to make the city more development friendly? I, d I just thought that there you definitely made some other changes and reduced the cost that I, I thought, you know, that was, a, that was a big change considering the last change was only two cents and now it was completely eliminating it. Uh, and it does go to the general fund, which there are definitely some, you know, areas that could use that support. So I would be in favor of if we change it to the 2016 rate. Uh, we do have a motion uh, that's been duly seconded to approve this item. Any further discussion? 
Seeing that, I'm ready for the question. All pair say aye. 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 All opposed? Aye. And the motion is adopted. Uh, Madam Clerk, item 23, please. It's an ordinance amending the Code of Ordinances, Title I, General Code, Chapter 1, Government Organization, Fees, Fines, and Penalties. Move for approval. Second. Motion made. Second to approve this item. Is there any discussion? My great appreciation to the uh, Parking Committee for this recommendation. This was really a struggle for people during COVID, um, and it has not gotten any easier with the change in economics that we've seen across our city. These fines were really a burden to people. And so I very much appreciate the effort that went in to get these changed. Um, I know that residents in Ward 3 struggled with this when there were snow events and their cars were towed. Um, so again, my deepest gratitude for this. It's a great move. Anyone else? Seeing that, ready for the question. All favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Do you guys have it? Um, on item 24, please. It's a resolution appropriating the sum of $166,000 for the Hall Street Wastewater Treatment Plant renovation and to apply for and accept the sum of $166,000 from the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services American Rescue Plan Act program for this purpose. Move approval. Second. Second. Motion made. Second to approve this item. Is there any discussion? <coughs> Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? <laughs> Have received an necessary two thirds. The motion is adopted. Madam Clerk, item 25, please. <laughs> it's a resolution appropriating the sum of $80,217 for the purchase of two all-terrain vehicles and related transport equipment and accepting the sum of $80,217 in American Rescue Plan Act funding through the New Hampshire Department of Justice. Move approval. Second. second. Your Honor, I'm recusing myself. Okay. Motion is made and seconded to adopt this item. Council Brown recuses herself. Is there any discussion? Council Rosalitz. Thank you. While I appreciate the intent behind this motion, I'll be voting against it. Um, I don't think there's a clear plan for how often these would be used, when or where. We don't have many accessible trails for ATVs as it is. The, a review of our Public Safety Advisory Board data does not show the increase in violent crime, the um, horrific tragedy aside. And um, we do have not, we cannot use these for cross use across other departments. So I'm a little concerned about having this investment in equipment that will not be utilized often, doesn't have a clear plan. I'd much rather see um, American Rescue Plan recovery dollars put towards addressing more urgent needs in the city. And if we do feel like we need these uh, pieces of equipment, I'd rather see them housed in another department um, that like Parks and Rec, General Services, and other that could cross-share with the police department instead of having these housed at the police department where they cannot be shared out for use by other city services. For all those reasons, um, I will be voting no. I do want to note the Conservation Commission did discuss this in September, but there's no vote or motion in support of this activity unless that is not reflected in the minutes. Thank you. Anybody else? Anything further? Seeing none, the question all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Nay. Have received necessary two thirds. The motion is adopted. <clears throat> Item 26, please. It is a resolution appropriating the sum of $45,000 for the purchase of used gas powered golf carts to supplement the electric golf cart fleet for golf outings and authorizing the use of $45,000 from golf fund balance for this purpose. Move approval. Second. Motion made second to approve this item. Is there any discussion? Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, since I've been a counselor, I've been hearing from lots of constituents about roads, sidewalks, pedestrian crossways, and I've been told, well, we don't have enough money right now. It's in the CIP. They have to wait. Stickney Hill, uh, the folks there are driving seven miles an hour because of the potholes, and they're competing with the roads in Penacook, which I have seen are pretty bad, so I'm not going to leapfrog over those. But we are dependent on the funds that are in the general fund that go toward this, towards that. There's a sidewalk along Pleasant Street that is ground down to gravel because so many people use it. It's ranked number six or seven in uh, sidewalks that should be done. But that is also um, out in the CIP for you know a couple of years. So I'm looking at these, and I'm also looking at this um, these golf carts, and they're not on the CIP, 
and in the minutes from the golf committee, it said that there are some tournaments that say they're having, uh, they have 120 people or 110 and only 80 show up. So those tournaments are being moved to the weekdays. So there's not a real demonstrated need. And I feel like if the golf course has extra funding, I would like to see it go towards more equitable recreational activities. There is a lot of money going into the golf course. Uh, there's two and a half million for irrigation. There's ha almost half a million for the design. Uh, and these are not covered by the golf fund. Um, it's troubling that <laughs> the golf course gets whatever they want whenever they ask for it, whether it's you know cutting down trees, um, and then the, that tree project was billed as something that would cost little to nothing. And in fact, it cost the city $100,000. So if, it really, if there really is a need for these golf carts, then I would like to see that need shown over the course of time. Uh, I would love to see if they have that extra money for it to go to uh, paving roads. Stickney Hill would cost $245,000. Uh, the sidewalk on Pleasant Street would cost $130,000. Um, other places, other groups are fundraising. The Monkey Round Playground has been fundraising for years for an ADA accessible playground. That playground had a lifespan of 20 years. It's now 30 years old. Uh, and if you've seen those flamingos, uh, that's them fundraising. Uh, you heard from Dick Lemieux, we could have a river walk without relying on DOT if we invested in the boardwalk, which is three, maybe four million. They cannot fundraise fast enough to keep up with inflation. So these are just a couple of groups um, that are busy fundraising, and I feel it's insulting to those groups that uh, the golf course can ask for 45,000 and receive it without doing any fundraising. And I do know that there is the capacity for fundraising at the golf course. There was a memorial policy that was drafted with Councillor Kredovic and uh, Jim Marshall on how to solicit donations for the golf course, and that has not been done, and I would like to see that done, and I would like to see uh, fundraising and donations uh, for the golf course. I will be voting um, no on this. Thank you. Just one quick point. Um, I appreciate your point, um, Councillor Brown, but I mean, I see this as an investment with a return. It's $45,000 expenditure, but it's going to generate revenue that will exceed the $45,000. So it's a good business investment in, in, in that enterprise fund, where right? it's not called that anymore, but, but it's, there's a return on that $45,000. It's just not, it's not an outlay. We're not seeing that money going back into the, I'm sorry. That's my only point. Thank, Thank you. you. Anyone else like to speak? That's great. Thanks, Your Honor. Um, uh, I think that some of the members from the community when they mentioned the fact um, the electric golf carts, they're so important um, for all of the uh, energy saving reasons that they spoke about. Um, I would love to see that with this purchase of the gas um, cart fleet that we use over the rest of this three year contract that we have with our current provider when there are opportunities to swap out the gas carts for the electric so that we can reduce that, that we do so. I also know that um, the golf course itself will be very mindful of the fact that people do not want to be in the gas car carts and they'll, they're going to use the electric first. Thanks. Cos Brown, would you like to speak again? I would just like to say that, yes, there, there is money that is generated, but it doesn't seem to leave the golf course. Um, we're not seeing it going into the general fund for other purposes. In fact, when there was even a question of, will we have an assistant um, golf pro, it was turned into a full-time position. Whereas with lifeguards, the first year lifeguards received less than all of the summer staff at Beaver Meadow. And when we didn't have enough lifeguards, we just shut down the pool. That was not an option at the golf course. Anyone else? Council Fennessy. Thank you. Um, I just want to highlight a couple things. There's currently a fleet of 60 electric golf carts. Um, this is to supplement those. So um, I had asked some questions of uh, the golf pro when he was up here before. So we're on a, we're on a contract right now, a lease, I think it's a three year lease of the 60. Um, we made the decision not to purchase 
or not to lease more at the time because we thought 60 was sufficient to service the people who were golfing. Golf continues to be more popular than we anticipated. Um, in the past, the when we had outings and tournaments where the number of players exceeded our cart capacity, you would go and you, you would get a rental cart, which is basically a, a trailer would show up with, you know, five or ten carts, whatever we needed. Uh, because of COVID and everybody wanting golf carts, that's become much harder to do. Um, they want those orders to get in at the beginning of the year. Sometimes we don't know. We're working with different groups, trying to be flexible uh, on the number of players. So this is an opportunity to supplement the cart fleet with used uh, gas carts. And so uh, I would uh, hope that you support that. Thank you. Um, Councilor Grady Sexton. Thank you, Your Honor. I don't have a problem with the appropriation, but I do have a problem with the environmental impacts while we uh, voting against this item and um, I'd prefer to see that we wait some time to see if we could obtain electronic cards. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Roll call. Sure. We'll start the roll call with Council Brown. No. Wait till she calls your name. Oh. Council Brown. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Council Champlin. Yes. Council Fennessy. Yes. Council Grady Sexton. No. Council Keach. Yes. Council Kredovic. Yeah. Councillor Matson. Yes. Councillor McNamara. Yes. Councillor Nyan. Yes. Councillor Pierce. Yes. Councillor Vice Hawkins. No. Councillor Todd. Yes. Councillor Bouchard. Yes. Mayor Boulay. Yes. So it passes 11 to 3. I, I receive the necessary two thirds. Motion is adopted. Madam Clerk, item 27, please. It is a resolution appropriating the sum of $39,989 for police department roadway safety and outreach initiatives and accepting the sum of $39,989 in grant funds from the New Hampshire Highway Safety Agency for this purpose. Second. I'll be Second to recusing myself. Council Brown is recognized and Council Brown announces she will be recusing herself from item 27. Is there any discussion? None. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Yes. I received the necessary two thirds. Motion is adopted. Madam Clerk, item 28. Yes. It's a resolution appropriating the sum of $24,436 for law enforcement related programs and accepting the sum of $24,436 in unmatched grant funds from the United States Department of Justice for this purpose. Move it. Motion made. Second to approve this item. I will be recusing myself. Use herself on this item. Uh, we do have a motion. Is there any discussion? Yeah, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Having necessary two thirds, motion is adopted. So, clerk, item next. Item 29 is a resolution appropriating the sum of $21,630 to support projects that enhance the special character and vitality of Concord and accepting the sum of $21,630 from the New Hampshire Charitable Foundation for this purpose. Second. Second. Motion made. Second to approve this item. Is there any discussion? Seeing none. All opposed? I'll try it again. How about all in favor say aye? Aye. 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 All opposed? have it have received necessary two-thirds of motions adopted uh, item 30 it's the public hearing on the New Hampshire Department of Transportation proposed changes to I-93 Bow Concord can you read the second one as well yes together with a report to City Council regarding I-93 Bow Concord widening project bridge park concept of approval so um, what I'd ask the council to do is to um, if, if the council be so willing to uh, support the report from the council on the I-93 widening deck park, uh, bridge park concept. Pass that this evening. Uh, I think we've got plenty of clarification on exactly um, in terms of specialty and such. And I'd like to hold on the, um, we did, we did uh, close the hearing, but I would like to um, recess any action until next month in terms of the, um, the first part. That is acceptable to everybody. Sure. Yes, please. What, what, I, I lost. I lost yeah. the trend of what you're proposing. Your so basically, the first part we hold till next month. Yes. And the second part we adopt this evening. I will move on, adopting the bridge park. I'll second. Everybody, 
Brown. Your Honor, I would just like to ask that we form uh, an ad hoc committee dedicated to looking at uh, river access, and that could be a subcommittee to RPAC. We've heard from everyone how much they want access to the river. I think I support the feasibility study, but what I would also like to see is a committee that's looking at looking more broadly how we can access, what are the best ways we can access the river, not just a deck park. And I think a committee, um, I didn't realize that there was one that worked on this in 1993, um, but I would like to see that in conjunction with a feasibility study. I'll take that in consideration, sure. Thank you. Councilor you do have your note? I just want to clarify. So the motion is to adopt the report yes. related to the feasibility. Yes. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> um, and then the goal would be. Uh, so we'll take everybody clear on the motion. Mm -hmm. Everybody with the question. Mm -hmm. All in favor yes. say. Yep. Uh, Council Bouchard. So what's the goal again? Well, like, why are we splitting it up? Uh, so I personally don't think we're ready to. Um, to act on uh, what we heard tonight. I think we heard a lot of testimony. I think we heard a lot of really good testimony. Um, I think we have TPAC's report. I think we have what we heard from the state. I think we have from what we heard tonight. And uh, maybe I'm slow at 10.48 in the evening, but I need some time to process that. And I am. my goal over the next month is to write down my thoughts and um, and then I would like, I'll probably, what I will probably do is sharing my thoughts in a written form and hand it out to you uh, next month. And I would encourage anybody else who wants to do the same thing, they should do the exact same thing. Okay. But that's how I was going to approach it. Um, I just it. need a little time to process it. Sounds good. Perfect. So is that a homework assignment? If you so choose. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think Jim can, Jim's not here, is he? You probably shouldn't share that information with each other. No, no. I, so I, I don't talk Jim, to each other about I, what you're thinking about. I would be right. bringing you're it. As a me you're acting as a meeting outside. So okay. do not send information back and forth and thoughts and comments to each other. Yeah. <clears throat> so we have a motion before us on the uh, go away. Anybody else have any questions? Councilor Isaac. Thank you. Um, to the concern that was raised by a couple of community members about having a firm that specializes in deck parks, um, just for the record and clarity, since City Council will vote on the appropriation, we could vet that at that time. Correct? Yeah, I think I think the, the I think the record's extremely clear on intent. Any else? Just one quick sure. question. Yeah. Does this in any way impact uh, DOT in slowing down their process? Or I mean, this is part of the 10-year plan, so I assume another month does not matter. Okay. So one of the reasons why um, I wanted it phrased the way it did so that it would not take an extra three or four months. For instance, we heard testimony tonight from, I apologize, I can't remember her name off the top of my head, uh, toward the end of the evening that said, hey, let's make sure that, you know, that whatever happens with I-93 that does not preclude anything we want to do. So we want to be able to work in conjunction hand in hand with them. And that way, if we can get this if we can get an idea, because right now I don't even know what the possible might be, you know? I mean, we know things like it's got to be 22 feet above a high-speed rail. Mm -hmm. We know that it, it just, it, and, and so I think that getting a feasibility study is really going to help clarify a lot of those things as opposed to us just standing out there and looking over the highway going, what could it be? Um, I think we're going to get some real conceptual designs. I think it's going to be helpful for us to make a decision. So. That's why I wanted to move this along, and I think the more information we have, the sooner we have, the better it will work, dovetail with whatever this comes to be with the state. Councilor Fennessy and then Councilor Quigley. Um, I was just going to respond to Fred's question. I think in the letter we got today that they're hoping to get through the preliminary design process by the end of the year, at least from DOT. 2023. End of next year. 23? Yes, that's a 23. <laughs> exactly. You've been here that's, my that's my point. That's my point. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I 100% I agree with what you're saying, given the fact that we had talked about a way to connect the river uh, 20 years ago and 30 years ago, precluding and just like limiting ourselves to a deck part wouldn't be the right option. But I think the DOT has already said that they will make a commitment to work with whatever team it is that we have to come up with whatever it is that it will not interfere 
with um, whatever that vision is, is going to be. And I, I read this report as the widest view possible to get what our city needs. That was the intent. Thank you. All right. Jim? It's all the buttons. <coughs> That's it? Okay. <laughs> motion. All right. It's all we have motion. Or Sounds nice, sir. I think do we have a cost of what this is going to be to put this proposal together? No, if you look at the last line of the report, I think it actually says uh, help me. Keep going, keep going. Because upon receiving proposals, staff would return to city council to seek an appropriation to fund said studies. There you go. Right. But it also intimates there's going to be a work effort involved prior to having those studies come back to us. So I'm wondering what the cost of the city is going to be leading up to this. That would all be done internal. Thank you. And then what we would do would, would when we talk to the firms, come back about um, what the different uh, costs are going to be associated with any teams that they need to pull together for this. But, I mean, I, I hope you're thinking really big. It's going to be a big number. So I suspect. Okay. Lots of zeros. Right. Those would be funds that we have yet to appropriate. Or, thank you. But, but let's not scare everybody right away because no. I don't think that uh, we have any idea. Yeah. Maybe somebody else does because they're a lot smarter than I am. But I really don't think we actually know what is possible at this point. I really don't think we do. I mean, I've sat out there behind that Bricksmore building and tried to imagine, and I, I haven't, I haven't figured it out. That's why they're. That's why I really hope we do this because there's lots of people a whole lot smarter who can figure this out. Alice Chapman. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, to be less succinct than I was before, this is our chance to vision big, and and there may be a big number involved, but the fact that we're moving forward on it, we're going to get to the point where we see what's possible. Uh, you know, this is a time for us to dream a little bit. This is a time for us to be a little bit ambitious. The dividends could be quite high, uh, and, and, and it's up to us to decide whether the, the payout is going to be worth the initial investment. Um, I, I find it interesting the conversation that we were having 20 years ago about the expansion of I-93 um, was centered around the extension of Store Street. And as a community, we made a conscious decision. We were going to go after redo in downtown because Store Street was not going anywhere. And we all said that we were going to dream big from one edge of the building to the other edge of the building, and everything was off the tape or off the, off the table. You could strip the road. You could change the sidewalks. We could do whatever it was that we wanted. And everybody thought we weren't going to get it done. And darn it, we went out and we got federal money, and we got the project done. And it was about thinking big. And so when our community comes to us and says, think beyond a highway, we should be thinking beyond a highway. And we should recognize that highway expansion includes the extension of Store Street that we wanted 20 years ago. Those things are important, but there is a visual impact to our community. There is a divide, and our community is telling us to think big and do big, and we should be looking at that vision and saying, we're going after the money. <clears throat> Thanks. Show me the money. Show me the money here. No, I'm kidding. Write that down. But we're going to go after it. That's that's the that's the goal here. What do we want? And let's go after it. Thanks. Sorry, it's late. I gotta go. <laughs> I still got non-public after this. I know. <clears throat> All right. Everybody, we have a question. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed. Motion's adopted. And so the first part is recess till the next meeting, and hopefully you all come back with your thoughts. Um. Do you have any comments by councilors? Anybody want to make any I comments? I just have a quick, quick comment. Um, my, my deepest gratitude to the city clerk's office and everybody that volunteered at the election season. From my um, friends here around the table here, it was a real struggle at Beaver Meadow this year. The wind, the cold, it was nasty. We have got to find a new place for people to vote. If you thought it was bad on Tuesday with the wind, um, just know that the last time at the primary, uh, when we were trying to count the ballots with the amount of rain that was coming down, the floor was coming up underneath us. It's a struggle. We need to find a new place. And um, so if you, we have some ideas, we're going to go scope out some places, but if, when it comes before the council for a new location, please 
please, please support us. We're tired of being in the tent. And well, let's just talk as quickly, Your Honor. I'll try to get these two items out uh, before we hit the stroke of midnight. The PVA, Penico Village Association, is sponsoring two events coming up. They're all free and open to the public. First is the 17th annual Penico Tree Lighting Ceremony, which is going to be on Wednesday, November 30th at 6 p.m. at Boudreaux Square on Village Street. Uh, attendees can assemble around 5.30 or 5.45 to hear carols and singing featuring the Pentecoke Elementary School Chorus and the Blanchard Family Singers and then watch Santa arrive courtesy of the Concord Fire Department. The second uh, is the Pentecoke Village Association's annual meeting on December 8th. That's going to be at 7 p.m. at the Pentecoke Elementary School Cafeteria. Uh, the guest speaker will be our own Matt Walsh. Uh, he will be discussing the following projects, Canal Street Park, uh, Pentecook Landing Phase 2 update, where site work for the second part of the building is underway, uh, Boys and Girls Club of Central New Hampshire's Pentecook Project Update, Whitney Road Development, including Merchants Way and additional projects in the development pipeline, and the Spring Summer of 2023 Paving Project for Pentecook Village, a preliminary overview of that. So if folks think that nothing's happening in Pentecook, <laughs> they're way off. That's a full-time <laughs> job. <laughs> Anyone else? Ms. Rose Hawkins and Council Chapel. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to extend appreciation to the Concord Police Department for their incredible work in apprehending um, the suspect in the double homicide. Um, I think serving justice for the Reeds is really important, and it's clear that our police department, as Chief Osgood said, made this a top priority and worked tirelessly, and the fact that it came down to 36 hours before that fugitive um, was going to board a one-way flight out of the country is just incredible, and so thankful for the work that they've done on this. Thank you, Your Honor. Actually, that's exactly what I was going to speak to. Uh, I think uh, Chief Osgood and his team did a, a fantastic job. I know that it's frustrating to the general public when they don't hear anything. They assume that nothing is happening, but there was a great deal happening, an awful lot of very, very, just very good police work, basic, solid police work that led to the apprehension of this suspect. Um, and I just wanted to recognize that as well. Anyone else? Councilor Rosa? <laughs> Uh, I also wanted to echo a comment made from a community member earlier. It was um, it was a terrible thing to have neo-Nazis and white supremacists in downtown Concord yesterday, but the real story is how the community showed up, including several of the city councilors here in the room today, um, and school board members and other community leaders who outnumbered those uh, individuals by at least four times, and a really big thank you to the teetotaler, which is bringing diverse programming into our city and did not back down. They could have easily canceled in the face of these threats. And I think it's so important as a community that we live our values in our welcoming, affirming space. And it was just a lovely, joyous celebration of how everyone in our community belongs and we support one another. And so um, I know that the storyteller said that she'd come back to Concord any time that we re-rocked and that was, uh, at the end of the day, just such a lovely thing to see. So thank you to everybody in the community who came out. Anyone else? Okay, Ms. Manager, do you have anything? Oh, you're right. Okay, we have uh, suspense one. Uh, suspense one, can I get a motion to suspend the rules to take up suspense one? Second. Motion made and second. All favor say aye. 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 All opposed, the ayes have it. Uh, suspense one is subject is new Pentecook Library and Community Center, and I'll just save you time, Madam mm -hmm. Clerk. This is the resolution appropriating the sum of one land, three hundred thousand dollars for the acquisition of real estate to be developed at seventy six Community Drive, Pentecook, for the purpose of establishing a new Pentecook Branch Library and Community Center, CIP six fifty, authorizing the city manager to enter into a purchase and sale agreement with the Boys and Girls Club of Rental Central New Hampshire, and to acquire said real estate, authorizing the issuance of bonds and notes in the sum of one, uh, $1,300,000 for this purpose and authorizing the divestment of city-owned property located at 3 Merrimack Street, Pentecook, together other, with other vacant city land located in the intersection of Sanders and Merrimack Street, Pentecook, tax map, parcel 1412P-57, upon completion of the new Pentecook Branch Library and Community Center at 76 Community Drive. Uh, the motion would be to uh, have a public hearing on this item in December. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. second. Motion made a second to have a public hearing on this item in December. Any questions? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? 
Ice Habit, and that will be set for a public hearing. Uh, I have no other business. Mr. Manager, do you have anything? No, Your Honor. Okay. So, um, Mr. Mayor, <coughs> if I may, uh, did we make a motion to seal minutes of our uh, non-public? We're not done with the non-public. We're going to actually oh, okay. go back into yeah, non-public right now. So, Council Pierce. Then do we need to <laughs> move think, that we meet past yeah. 11? The mayor pro tem is going to make the mayor pro tem is going to make a motion prior to. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm going to make a motion, but it's a, after 11. Exactly. Okay. Rule 16. Um, we um, to go forward. We need to vote, and it's a two-thirds vote to continue. So the motion, the motion, is, motion is made to go beyond 11, 11 o'clock. <laughs> continues with the rules. Is there a second? Second. Motion made seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. The ayes have it. <laughs> As usual. Council Pierce moves. We go back into non-public session in accordance with RSA 91, A column 2, I, excuse me, A column 3 to discuss property acquisition. Second. Motion made and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? The ayes have it. Is that unanimous? Yes. yes. Okay. Thank you. Good luck getting those tickets, Keith.